Hello and welcome to the BMB Gums Year 2 Review Lecture. My name's Michael, I'm a Year 3 med student at Griffith, and this lecture uh, I've done my best to cover a little bit of everything from BMB. Uh, we're not really going into much detail with anatomy. Uh, we do a little bit to do with stroke and head trauma, um, but mainly this is going to be focused on everything that isn't anatomy. Sergio will be put, putting together a good anatomy lecture, um, and Dis's lectures for anatomy are brilliant. So, yeah, this lecture uh, will cover basically everything from BMB in the order of the PBL cases. And if you study your anatomy really well outside of this and have a rough idea of everything that comes up during this lecture, you will almost definitely pass the BMB exam. I can't guarantee it. Uh, but yeah, if you have a very good knowledge of anatomy and a decent knowledge of everything that comes up here, you should be doing very, very well. So the things I'm going to cover today, uh, and in the description of this video, I'm going to try and put timestamps so that you can jump to each of these major topics because I'm expecting this will be quite a long video. Um, but the things I'm going to cover are lesion hunting, so strokes of the central, um, you know, cortex, capsule, brain stem, spinal cord, and then peripheral lesions, um, which is more of an anatomy concept. Not going to cover those in detail, but make sure you do. <laughs> Parkinson's and other conditions like Tourette's, Huntington's, and Wilson's, and essential tremor, but Parkinson's is the yield there, really. Epilepsy, very briefly, but Again, before you do third year, make sure you do get a good idea of what pediatric epilepsy looks like, um, because they grill you on it. <laughs> uh, intracranial bleeds, very quickly, haven't really gone deep into the anatomy of brain herniation though, make sure you cover that, as well as skull base fractures. Cerebral palsy, very quickly, and some of its causes. Psychiatry, a rough overview with some slides borrowed from the GUMS Year 3 lecture. Thank you very much to Reese Harris, who put that together, and I'll um, point out his slides when we get there. Bones, joints, muscles, dementia and delirium, pain, eyes and ears. Okay, so throughout this lecture, I've borrowed some images from other lectures, from GUM slides, and I will credit those as best as I can. It's a little bit tricky though, because for a lot of the lectures, they just stole their pictures from Google Images, um, but I'll do my best when they come up to point out the doctor that provided these slides. Um, considering that this is a not-for-profit lecture, I think they will be okay with reproducing those images. Uh, this lecture doesn't cover anatomy in detail, and I've attempted to cover everything, but where I've only covered things briefly, I've tried to point you towards the AMH and textbooks. Okay, so lesions. The ones we care about are either in the cortex or the internal capsule, the brainstem, the spinal cord, or the peripheral nervous system, which is more of an anatomy topic, upper limb nerve lesions, lower limb nerve lesions. Lesions above the brainstem can be in the cortex or the capsule for our purposes. How do you tell them apart? Both of them will affect the limbs because the motor pathways come from the cortex and go through the capsule. Well, there are two main things that you should understand. Firstly, the lobes of the cortex do more than the internal capsule. So therefore, the deficit is greater in terms of these cortical-specific signs, such as a graphia, a calculia, sensory inattention, a bulia, cortical blindness, etc. All of those point towards the cortex. Now, that's not to say you can't have damage to both at the same time, but those signs mean that at least that part of the cortex must be damaged. That's the only way you could get sensory inattention or hemineglect. That is on top of the upper limb and lower limb signs of motor and sensory deficits. The other thing with those signs that helps you to differentiate is that 
The homunculus, which I'm going to show you in a second, the diagram of the body spread out over the brain, it's much more spread out in the cortex compared to the capsule, such that if you had a two centimeter ischemic lesion to the cortex, say it's on the most lateral, sort of outside part of the parietal lobe, frontal lobe, like an MCA division stroke, that would affect the leg and the face more than the upper, the, sorry, the upper limb and the face more than the lower limb. If you had the same size stroke, but of the capsule, the whole capsule is only a, like, you know, six or seven centimeters looking top down, that two, three centimeter lesion would knock out everything for the limbs and potentially the cranial nerves. So the upper limb and lower limb signs will be equal in a capsular lesion, or at least more likely to be equal compared to a cortical one. So to summarize that, cortical stroke has cortical signs and a difference between the upper and the lower limb deficit. Capsular lesions don't have cortical signs and the upper and lower limb deficits are typically equivalent. Here's the divisions um, and the blood supply to the brain from each division. So keep this diagram in your mind because if you ever forget about a certain stroke or whatever, you can just visualize this and you can ask yourself, oh, well, you know, what does the temporal lobe do? What does the outside portion of the frontal and parietal lobes do? What does the angular area back here do? And then you can guess what an MCA stroke looks like. What does the posterior parietal lobe do? Oh, well, that's all those weird cortical signs that come with an MCA stroke, like hemi neglect. An ACA stroke does this internal sagittal surface down the longitudinal fissure, which is where the legs are and the micturition centers and the prefrontal cortex. The PCA does this occipital lobe area and a little bit of the temporal lobe. Cortical blindness is a PCA sign. So as long as you remember this diagram, you can guess what the cortical signs of each lesion will be. So it's a very good diagram. And on a radiological point of view, this would be the area that would be affected by a M1, M2 stroke. So let's specifically talk about the ACA. And here's the homunculus I was talking about. So you see how an MCA stroke, which does this outside wedge, would affect the face and the upper limb, whereas an ACA stroke, which does this internal surface here, affects the lower limb more than the upper limb. Additionally, um, bilateral lesions can cause urinary incontinence, and from this is from AMBOSS. You additionally get some abulia, which is basically not wanting to do anything, because of damage to the prefrontal cortex in an ACA stroke. So ACA stroke, lower limb more than upper limb for motor and sensory because of the homunculus, because of the distribution of blood flow and the leg homunculus being around here. An MCA stroke. MCA has the most signs out of any of the vessels. If you see a lot of signs in a stem of a question, start thinking of the MCA. It's got upper limb more so than lower limb signs in terms of the sensory and the motor deficit. Additionally, because the face is around this area, including the tongue and you know the muscles of the face, you get a contralateral lower quadrant facial paralysis and a contralateral tongue protrusion. These are both upper motor neuron signs. Compare that to the lower motor neuron equivalent, which would be for the face, a Bell's palsy, which would be an ipsilateral paralysis of the whole face, half the face. Whereas the lower motor neuron hypoglossal nerve lesions, such as after carotid and directotomy, uh, that ends up with the tongue protruding to the same side as the lesion, and that's where the name lick the wound comes from. So upper motor neuron, because the facial nerve nucleus, the, the part that does the top half of your face, has dual cortical innervation, 
a stroke doesn't cause paralysis of the top half of your face. But the lower half of the nucleus only has contralateral innervation, so therefore a stroke on the left results in a deficit in the lower right quadrant of the face. <clears throat> Compared to a Bell's palsy of, say, the left facial nerve, where the whole left half of your face would be paralyzed. Similarly, upper motor neuron tongue lesion, a stroke on the left makes the tongue deviate to the right. Lower motor neuron damage to the hypoglossal nerve makes the tongue deviate to the same side as the lesion. So a left lower motor neuron hypoglossal lesion makes the tongue protrude to the left, whereas a stroke on the left makes the tongue go to the right. <clears throat> The frontal eye fields. The left frontal eye field is in charge of making your eyes conjugately gaze to the right. So if you damage the left frontal eye field, you won't be able to look to the right. Therefore, your eyes will have to deviate to the left. They deviate to the same side as the lesion. The optic pathway has some areas done by the MCA, and the most common finding is a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. We'll talk a little bit more about the visual pathway later, but it's more, you know, covered in more detail during anatomy rather than this lecture. The parietal lobe, so the it's sort of more the posterior portion of it that does this sort of stuff, um, depending on if it's dominant or non-dominant, you get specific signs. Again, this is how you would tell the difference between a capsula stroke and an MCA cortical lesion. Now, Broca's area and Wernicke's area are both supplied by branches of the MCA, sort of distal branches on different divisions. So depending on the location of the thrombus, you could just have a Broca's or just a Wernicke's, but if you had a lesion obstructing flow to both of these branches, say earlier on in the MCA's course, you would have a global aphasia with both areas lost. Broca's aphasia, Broca's area is in control of actually producing the speech physically. Um, and so that's why it's an expressive aphasia with non-fluent speech, but your understanding of speech that people say to you is still intact. When Nikki's area is responsible for understanding the speech that comes in, and that's why it's a receptive aphasia. So you produce fluent speech, but it means nothing, and you don't understand what other people say to you. As we said, the left frontal eye field controls your ability to conjugately gaze to the right. So a stroke on the left means you can no longer look to the right, and so your eyes will deviate to the left they deviate to the same side as the lesion. Same thing for the right frontal eye field. You will have ipsilateral deviation, in that case, to the right, because you're not able to look to the left. Uh, this is a slide from Dissa from Anatomy. Um, and I just wanted to give you some tips for understanding lesions in the visual pathway. Uh, but the anatomy tutors have probably already walked you through all of this. So the ones that you need to know would be a lesion at the optic chiasm, and then lesions down basically all the ones that are labelled here. So a trick to remember that is firstly just memorise that an optic chiasm lesion leads to bitemporal hemianopia. That one will come up now and also again in P4P with pituitary tumours because they press down on the chiasm. The basic rule of the visual pathway is that all the fibres on the left side of the brain do the right side of the visual field and vice versa. That's why, say, a lesion on the left leads to a contralateral homonymous hemianopia, so a right-sided loss of vision in both eyes. Everything that's anatomically on the top does the bottom half of your visual field, and everything on the bottom does the top half. What does that mean? Well, this is how you can remember Borm's and Meyer's loops. Borm's loop is anatomically on top of Meyer's loop because it's in the parietal lobe, whereas Meyer's loop is out sort of more in the temporal lobe and it's inferior to the Borm's loop. Because Borm's loop is 
superior, you know, it's on top, it does the bottom half of vision, the inferior field. And because Maya's loop is inferior, it does the superior field of vision. And then putting these two dot points together, we can then predict that a left Borms loop lesion, because it's the left side of the brain, it must be the right side of vision. And because Borms loop is superior to Maya's loop, it must be the inferior field. And putting that together, you end up with a right-sided homonymous inferior quadrantinopia from a left Borms loop lesion. You didn't even have to think. You just put these two dot points together. So let's do some more. Say this lesion here at A, this is sort of a exception to the rule, I guess you could say. This is literally just cutting the optic nerve. So in that case, you're just not getting vision from that eye. You lose everything from that eye. Cool. The other lesions are what we're talking about with the rule. So say the lesion in B, that's a right-sided lesion of the optic tract. Well, it's on the right side, and it hasn't been split up into superior and inferior anatomical fibers. So it's a right-sided lesion. So therefore, it's a left-sided homonymous hemianopia, as you can see here in B. So a contralateral hemi homonymous hemianopia is what you get from B and also E. The extra bit of superior and inferior comes up with Myers and Borms loop. Borms loop is superior in blue compared to Myers loop, and it's the right side. So a right-sided Borms loop lesion, which is the superior fiber, must result in a left-sided inferior quadrantinopia, as you can see over here in the circle drawn for D. For a Myers loop lesion on the right side, which is anatomically inferior, the functional loss then would be left-sided superior quadrantinopia, as shown by diagram C. Okay, the only other thing to add is that if you have a vascular lesion to the occipital lobe, you get contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macula sparing because the macula has dual blood supply. Okay, I hope that made sense. The Borms loop is anatomically superior, so you get a contralateral inferior quadrantinopia. It's just the opposite of whatever it is. If it's on the left, the visual loss is on the right, and if it's on the top, the visual loss is on the bottom. Okay, and here is the AMBOSS summary of an MCA stroke. This is a radiological sign that you should know very well. A stroke doesn't really show up that well on CT in the early stages, so you have to look for signs that are sort of clues. There are two clues that a radiologist looks for. The one that you need to know is this thing here. It's, if we look at its density, so bone is more dense than brain, and this is a CT scan, the bone is very white, the brain is gray, and the CSF is black. Compared to CSF, this little worm is very dense. It's more dense than the brain, and it's almost as dense as bone. This is a thrombus in M1. This is the M1 hyperdense sign, and it's an early sign that there's been a thrombus in the MCA. The other sign they look for in an MCA stroke is loss of gray-white differentiation of the insular ribbon, but who cares about that? This is the M1 hyperdense sign. Make sure you know this. It's a sign of an MCA stroke. Lacuna infarcts. These are tiny little strokes that happen throughout your life, and they're typically only found post-mortem. They're asymptomatic a lot of the time, and they're less than two to one and a half centimeters in size. They're more common in people with high blood pressure, and they can cause isolated neurological deficits. So for example, the reason I've put this in with MCA is that from M1, you have the lenticulostriate arteries, which are the deep branches that do portions of the internal capsule. 
but you can have lacuna infarx of all the other deep perforating branches, like the branches of the PCA or the ACA. But specifically, these ones will interfere in the internal capsule, and so you might end up with paralysis of your arm, but nothing else. And the sensory might even be intact. You know, it's an isolated neurological deficit, um, and it's because of a tiny little stroke that has just popped up in a deep, deep perforated branch somewhere in your brain. Here are all the possible syndromes, and so pure motor, pure sensory, mixture, ataxia, etc. They're just tiny little strokes that happen everywhere in people with high blood pressure. The version of this is, um, if you have this sort of more of an advanced degree, is quite similar to vascular dementia, which we'll talk about later. PCA strokes, the thing you should memorize is the contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macula sparing. So you lose blood supply to one half of your occipital lobe at the back. You therefore get cortical blindness, which will be, again, because say it's the right occipital lobe, you will have a left-sided homonymous hemianopia. But the portion that supplies the macula area of vision in that occipital lobe on the right will not die. And so your left-sided macular vision will be intact. So that's why it would be a contralateral homonymous hemianopia, but the macula is spared. If you want to look back at this diagram, that's what F is showing. So in F, we've got a right-sided occipital lobe infarct, and it has to be a vascular lesion, because obviously if you just had a big brain tumor here, the macular area would be destroyed. But a vascular ischemic lesion to the occipital lobe, the calcer and sulcus most importantly, would result in contralateral, so left-sided, homonymous hemianopia, but the portion of this right side that does the macula, so this left-sided macular vision, would be intact because of dual blood supply. So that's your main cortical strokes. The other one I just wanted to mention was a, um, the actual carotid artery having a stroke? Well, if the ICA was obstructed on the left and you had an intact circle of Willis, all the blood from the right can be deviated over to that side and accommodate for that lesion to some degree. Now, a lot of people have atherosclerosis in those branches or those branches just can't compensate enough. So that means those people would have signs quite similar to an MCA stroke. The other thing to sort of mention with an ICA stroke is this idea of amaurosis fugo, which is a painless loss of vision. That can be one of the earliest clinical signs of an ICA lesion. This is where your carotid brui comes up in your physical examination. So that's all the main cortical syndromes of stroke. Let's talk a bit about the capsule. Now, because the homunculus of the capsule is very close together physically, as we said, a two centimeter to three centimeter lesion of the capsule would knock out the arm and the leg. Okay, you could also have a lesion to genu, which would result in upper motor neuron cranial nerve signs. Um, but because of dual cortical innervation of most of those nuclei, the only signs that would show up would be the tongue and the face, which we described in the MCA stroke. Now, a internal capsule lesion, would it cause a graphia, a calculia, denial of left-sided deficit, etc.? No, because all of that stuff is happening out in the parietal lobe of the cortex, so no cortical signs you would just have motor sensory cranial nerve signs. And the motor signs would likely be equal between the upper and lower li limb. <clears throat> the only um, trick here is that your ability to speak um, may be impaired, right? Because of the cranial nerve innervation of your throat, but Broca's area isn't damaged. So this, is a, this isn't dysphagia, this is dysarthria. Um, because of tongue issues, okay? So just make it, make it clear in your mind the difference between dysarthria and dysphagia. 
Um, also consider the blood supply of the internal capsule to help you remember these lesions. Um, the way I like to remember this is firstly that there's, so this slide is borrowed from Dissa's anatomy lecture. Thank you very much to Dissa. There is a T shape of blood, which is the lenticulostriate branches of MCA, which come off of M1. They do this top portion of the internal capsule, as well as all of Genu. Then the only leftovers are the inferior, posterior, and anterior limbs of the internal capsule. I remember this because the anterior, pos anterior inferior limb has the ACA, the anterior cerebral artery, um, supplying it, while the posterior inferior portion of the internal capsule is done by the anterior choroidal artery. Now, it's a bit annoying that that's called anterior when it's the posterior limb, uh, but you just kind of have to live with that. One way I like to remember this, and this is a little bit abstract, is that pathways, the visual fibers here, go through the posterior limb at the very back, and vision makes me think of the eye, and the eye, the blood supply of the eye, um, is the choroid. The choroid is that name of the tunic that supplies blood to the eye. So vision, choroid, anterior choroidal is where the visual pathways are, and the visual pathways are at the back. The back of the eye, the back of the internal capsule, vision. I don't know if that helps, but you know. So Genu, here in the middle, if you had an lenticulostriate branch obstruction, you'd lose all of Genu as well as the top halves of the anterior and posterior limbs, but the bottom halves are done by ACA and anterior choroidal, respectively. Don't get them mixed up, please. Brainstem lesions. So up to you how, how uh, intense you want to get with these. They can get pretty complicated, um, but basically the ones you should know are the pons, the medulla, and uh, the midbrain, Weber's syndrome. There's way more that you'll find on AMBOSS, but these are the three that I think you need. Some tricks before we even get started. How do you know when someone has a brainstem stroke? Well, you'll still have contralateral body signs typically because, you know, the fibers for, say, motor or sensory go through the brainstem to get to the spinal cord. Now, because we're not actually knocking out the whole brainstem, you won't necessarily always have motor signs. But just as a general rule, if someone, say, had, you know, paralysis on their left side, and then something was going funny on the right side of their head, well, then you'd know that it must be a right-sided brainstem lesion, which has damaged the lower motor neuron of whatever cranial nerve to their right side, and then the upper motor neuron before it decussates for the left side of their body. So the trick to identify a brainstem lesion is having mixed signs with ipsilateral cranial nerve signs because of damage to the cranial nerve nucleus, and contralateral signs in the body, whether it's sensory or motor. Okay, that may be a bit complex now, but in a few weeks when you revisit this lecture, that's going to be a very simple concept. Left side of the face, right side of the body, it must be a left-sided brainstem lesion. Now, the other one um, to help you is to differentiate the pons from the medulla. The pons has the nucleus of the facial nerve. So if you have facial nerve signs, it must be lateral pontine syndrome, ICA syndrome. You don't get those lower motor neuron facial nerve signs in lateral medullary syndrome. Weber's syndrome is quite easy. It's ipsilateral cranial nerve three signs with contralateral motor signs because of damage to the cerebral peduncle. Okay, let's look at those in detail. These are from my PBL notes, so I'm sorry that they don't look um, crisp. Uh, but this is lateral pontine syndrome. And I've got a diagram of the lateral pons here that, again, is blurry. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is Ica syndrome, is the other name for this one. 
If we look at the structures of the inferior lateral pons, which is the bit that's supplied by ICA, you have loss of the cochlea and vestibular nucleus, which is sort of a shared sign between this and the medulla lesion. You've got the spinothalamic tract um, and some tracts that involve the face, sensation, as well as the lower motor neuron of the facial motor nucleus. The medial lemniscus and the cerebral peduncles are intact, so you don't have any motor signs to the body. So what does that look like when you put it all together? Normal motor to their body, normal proprioception to their body because the medial lemnisci are intact, but a contralateral loss of pain and temperature for the body. Why is that? That's because the spinothalamic tract doing pain and temperature is uh, a part of the lateral pons lesion. Ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature to the face, that's because the spinal trigeminal tract, so par part of that ventral trigeminothalamic tract that does all your face pain, temperature, proprioception, a pretty complicated pathway to be honest, um, that's why you would lose that. And it's ipsilateral because you're actually destroying the nucleus itself, okay? That's the difference between this and a cortical stroke or something. You're actually destroying the structure in the brainstem during this lesion. Ipsilateral loss of coordination. Um, now, I'm not totally sure if that's shown well on this diagram. It is. The middle cerebellar peduncle. So that would be somewhere around here, connecting the pons to the cerebellum. By damaging that, you end up with cerebellar signs. Cere cerebellar signs are always ipsilateral either because the cerebellum decussates and then decussates again, or because it never decussated in the first place. The left cerebellar hemisphere controls the coordination for the left side of the body. It just does. It's either a double decussation to cancel itself out, or it just never decussated in the first place. That's moderate yield, but just remember that the cerebellum on the left controls the left side of the body. Um, the taste and the submandibular and sublingual salivary gland functions, that's because of your um, loss of the facial nerve nucleus and the paralysis of the face, similarly, lower motor neuron. So that would be the whole side of the face on the ipsilateral side to the lesion. Okay, so... Um, have a look at this slide in your own time. Hopefully it's correct. I wrote this during second year. Um, yeah, so nausea, vomiting, vertigo, deafness from those vestibulocochlear nuclei, uh, coordination and ataxia from the cerebellar peduncle, uh, the facial nucleus, facial nerve signs, and the spinothalamic tract signs. Horner's syndrome is shared. Um, between this and lateral medullary syndrome, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so lateral medullary syndrome then. You've got the vestibular nucleus leading to vomiting, vertigo, and nystagmus. You've got your inferior cerebellar peduncle this time, again leading to the cerebellar signs. You've got the spinothalamic tract again, so pain and temperature. You've got the spinal trigeminal, again leading to pain and temperature in the face. You've got nucleus ambiguous now, which is in the medulla. So you get uh, ipsilateral motor signs to the uvula and the um, pharynx, um, which is that's sort of unique to lateral medullary syndrome. And so it will present itself as a deviated uvula. Uh, with hoarseness of voice, dysphagia, and a loss of gag reflex. You'll also, again, have ipsilateral Horner's syndrome because you're damaging those sympathetic fibers which are coming down the brainstem before they then come out at the T1 root to come back up into the head. So looking at that anatomically, this is a diagram I got from Google, but it's also the one DISA uses. 
you've got nucleus ambiguous, you've got the descending tract of trigeminal, which is your facial sensation, uh, you've got the peduncle, you've got the vestibular nucleus, and you've got sympathetic fibers going down uh, to get ready to come back up again. The anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system to the face is very strange. Uh, the sympathetic fibers come down the brainstem, out the spinal cord, and then they climb back up the neck into the face to do their job. It's really weird. Uh, you'll notice that the um, the medial lemniscus and the pyramids are intact, so there's no motor signs to the body. So the, the best way to differentiate this from Ica syndrome is that the facial nucleus is in the pons and not the medulla, and so there's no facial paralysis in lateral medullary syndrome. Honestly, that is the best way um, that I can find. Okay, Weber's syndrome, the anterior midbrain, which is supplied by little branches of the PCA. The structures, the best way to look at this is this diagram from Wikipedia. You've got cranial nerve three on the same side as the lesion coming out. Uh, you've got the cerebral peduncle and you've got the substantia nigra. So if you put all of that together, you've got an ipsilateral cranial nerve three palsy, which is a lower motor neuron palsy to the eye. Um, again, if you had a stroke, you wouldn't get a cranial nerve three palsy because it's got dual cortical innervation, but this is a lower motor neuron lesion, okay? So you do. Now, it's always important to learn the down and out palsy of cranial nerve three versus the trochlear nerve palsy. Uh, just make sure to learn all of that for your anatomy, okay? Um, the cerebral peduncle carries upper motor neuron motor fibers, so you'll have upper motor neuron signs, okay? So those signs would include, you know, contralateral loss of motor to the limbs. Now the sensory fibers don't go through the cerebral peduncle. So this is just a motor, motor signs to the uh, opposite side of the body in an upper motor neuron kind of picture. Okay, so lateral pontine syndrome was all of that stuff, but specifically the facial nerve signs. Lateral medullary was everything but not the facial nerve signs. And Weber's syndrome is cranial nerve three plus upper motor neuron signs from the cerebral peduncle. Make sure to study those well, draw them from scratch and know all the symptoms because it's a very good short answer question and it's a very good anatomy question. Okay, spinal cord. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this in very much detail, um, but here's a diagram I stole from Dissa's lecture. Thank you, Dissa. So if we have a look at Dissa's spinal cord cross sections here, there's a couple of syndromes that you should at least be aware of, uh, if only for multi-choice questions. That's the anterior cord syndrome, the posterior cord syndrome, brown sequard, or I like to call it brown squidward, and the central cord whiplash syndrome. Let's start with anterior cord. Basically, just remember that the front half of the spinal cord does motor stuff, while the back half does sensory stuff. That's a very crude, you know, way to remember it. And obviously, pain and temperature sensation is the spinothalamic tract. But just speaking very generally, the signs of an anterior cord syndrome are motor signs. Okay, so from this AMBOSS summary table, anterior cord syndrome has bilateral motor paralysis and loss of pain temperature from the spinothalamic at and below the level of the lesion. Posterior cord involves the dorsal columns, so you have bilateral loss of your DCML pathway, uh, so you lose your proprioception, vibration, and touch. And that, depending on you know, the size of the lesion, it'll either be bilateral or just ipsilateral. Brown-Sequard syndrome is an awesome one to know. Uh, so basically, it's cutting the spinal cord in half, and it never happens in real life, but it's a really good way to learn spinal cord pathways. 
So if we cut the left half of the spinal cord, the thing you need to remember is that the spinothalamic pathway decussates within the spinal cord over two spinal levels, whereas the dorsal columns don't decussate until they reach the medulla. Okay? So if you cut the left dorsal column, you lose the left-sided dorsal column sensations at and below the level of the lesion. So that's ipsilateral. When you cut the left spinothalamic pathway, that pathway, for example at T7, is actually carrying spinothalamic information that came up from T9 and below and decussated and ended up at T7 on the opposite side of the spinal cord. So you get contralateral loss of spinothalamic information, which is from two levels below the lesion and below. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, sit down, draw it out a few times and get it in your mind because this is a, you know, a good exam question. Uh, also just be aware that there's motor signs too. Because you've cut through, say T7, you're going to have lower motor neuron paralysis of whatever is innervated by T7 because you've literally just destroyed that half of the spinal cord. Um, but you've also cut off the connection between the upper motor neuron of the corticospinal tract that's heading down through T7. So you're going to have upper motor neuron signs at T8 and below. For example, a positive Babinski sign. Okay, so spastic paralysis type of signs. Um, make sure you understand this one well. The other one that DISA goes through properly is central cord syndrome. And basically just be aware that your upper limbs, which are innervated by cervical nerve roots, th there is a homunculus in the spinal cord. And on that homunculus, they are more internal. They're, they're closer to the center of the spinal cord. Whereas the lumbar and sacral roots doing your legs and you know the saddle area, that's all uh, peripheral and it won't be damaged when the central cord is damaged. This, is, this happens in whiplash, okay? So whiplash will present with upper limb signs, okay, more so than the lower limb signs and there will be sacral sparing. Just remember that term. Okay, peripheral nerve lesions. I, uh, I don't want to go through these. Um, there's good anatomy lectures for the upper limb and the lower limb. You can just make sure you understand neuralgia parasthetica and foot drop and uh, just know the peripheral cutaneous innervation of the leg. But the, um, the thing I wanted to get across is something that I didn't actually understand until the very end of BMB, uh, which is my own fault, is the difference between a dermatome and the distribution innervated by the cutaneous nerves. Uh, so let's look at, for example, the uh, L2 dermatome, which is the thigh here at the front. That is a description of all the skin that is innervated by the L2 nerve root. If you cut the L2 nerve root, you will lose that band of innervation on the front of your thigh. Okay? Compare that here to the peripheral cutaneous nerves that actually bring those fibers to the skin. You've got the anterior femoral cutaneous nerve and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. They both carry fibers of L2 and L3. Okay? So this whole region here done by L2, you can imagine that that is the L2 component of these two separate peripheral nerves. And that means if I was to sever L2 at the spinal cord, I would lose the L2 dermatome, but below that would be fine. Even though L2 is a component of these peripheral nerves, the L3 component would be intact and the L3 dermatome at the knee would be fine. If I just cut the anterior femoral cutaneous nerve, it would affect the L2 and L3 innervation of this area that's done by that peripheral nerve. But the whole 
L2 and L3 innervated area from lateral femorocutaneous, that would be intact. Okay, so an L2 lesion at the spinal cord will result in a deficit at the L2 dermatome. But a peripheral nerve lesion, which is different from a dermatome, will result in loss of that whole peripheral region, which includes fibers of L2, but also other nerve roots. Okay, um, so dermatomes are only really relevant if you're actually cutting the nerve root or the spinal cord at that level, whereas these peripheral ones are what, you know, what the actual nerves are that innervate the skin and that they carry fibers from those nerve roots. Okay, now the reason I bring this up is because when we first learned about shoulder dislocation and we learned that the axillary nerve is damaged and that there's this sensory loss at the regimental badge on your shoulder tip, uh, I didn't understand that because I thought, oh, the shoulder is the C4 dermatome. Why would you just lose that little patch and not the whole C4 dermatome? Or how does that happen? Um, it just didn't click in my head that, oh, the axillary nerve, yes, it's carrying fibers of C4, but it's only doing that little regimental patch on the side of the shoulder, whereas other nerves are carrying C4 fibers to everywhere else in the dermatome. And if you cut the C4 nerve root, you would lose the whole dermatome, whereas when you damage the peripheral axillary nerve in a shoulder dislocation, you're just going to lose the distribution which is done by the axillary nerve. I know that's probably common sense to most of you, but just in case there's anyone else out there like me who never quite got this definition in your mind that a dermatome and a peripheral cutaneous innovation map are two different things, uh, hopefully that has helped you. Okay, speaking of nerve lesions, let's jump back and cover uh, some definitions which are in an LO, uh, which may or may not be important. Neuropraxia the most mild form of nerve injury, basically just from squishing the nerve, you know, sleeping on it or using crutches, um, Saturday night palsy, etc. This will always heal. Um, and the only thing that's damaged is the myelin around the axon. All the connective tissue that makes up the nerve is intact. It's just the myelin that's uh, damaged. And it might not even be totally demyelinated, okay? But because of that loss of myelin, the conduction is altered and you end up with paresthesia, which is the burning, tickle, tickling, tingling, numb sort of pins and needles feeling. And it will heal within a couple of months. So there is my artistic representation of demyelination. The axon is intact, but the myelin sheath is a little bit unhappy. The endoneurium connective tissue around the nerve fiber is intact. Okay. Axonotmesis. Otmesis is to cut, I guess, or to lose. It's demyelination plus actually severing that axon. Okay. And that's going to have to undergo Wallerian degeneration, which is basically just the some macrophages come and eat up the dead bits of axon and it will have to regrow from the body of the neuron back again. So it, it grows slowly, so two to four millimeters a day. You can imagine to grow from your lumbar spinal cord all the way to your big toe, if you damage that nerve, uh, you could be talking over a year of healing time, right? Um, hopefully that maths works out. I just made that number up, but it would take a long time. So because the endoneurium is intact, healing will take place within this little tube, okay? It's the presence of this tube that makes everything work. You've lost the axon, you've lost the myelin, but the connective tissue around it is intact and so it can heal within that scaffold. Finally, neurotmesis or neuronotmesis is cutting everything. Um, this is what happens when your surgeon goes in and accidentally cuts the gen genitofemoral nerve um, or, you know, whatever else happens. Uh, and it will take a surgeon to fix it in microsurgery. And what happens here is they've cut the axon, the myelin sheath, the endoneurium, which is what lines the individual neuron. Uh, 
potentially the perineurium, which lines the whole nerve fascicle, and possibly even they've just cut the whole thing, including the epineurium around the outside of the nerve. That's not going to heal on its own. It needs to be tied back together, and even then it will never be the same as it once was. Here's that anatomy, um, just in case you've never seen this before, which it certainly is possible in self-directed learning land. Uh, you've, a nerve is made up of thousands of neurons, okay? The axons of thousands of neurons. The thing that, I, this is sort of a, an aside, but an important one, the lower motor neuron that comes from the spinal cord out to your fingertip, for example, that's one neuron in terms of length, okay? But surrounded by thousands of other neurons and wrapped up in connective tissue is called a nerve, all right? I made two errors when I first learned all this in biomed. I thought a nerve was one big neuron, and I thought that there were thousands of synapses from you know, tiny little nerve cells talking to each other all the way down. But no, when they say, you know, the motor pathway has an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron, it's literally one neuron from the brain down and then one neuron from the spinal cord out in terms of length. So that's a very long axon of one cell Okay, but it, it's it's surrounded by thousands of other neurons which are packaged into a fascicle surrounded by perineurium, and then fascicles go together with a bit of a blood supply with an epineurium. Okay, so two concepts there, just in case you've sort of missed the mark like I did. You've got one axon here, which would have gone all the way up to a cell body that lives in the ventral root of the gray matter of the spinal cord, and that axon goes all the way out, traveling in this nerve, surrounded by myelin, surrounded by endoneurium, packed in a fascicle with all those other nerves coming from that area, surrounded by the rest of the connective tissue and with blood supply. That is a nerve. Thousands of neurons are packaged into nerves. But in terms of length, there are no synapses happening inside of the nerve once you leave the spinal cord. That is insane. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yep, dermatome versus peripheral innovation, please, I hope that made sense. All right, that is the lesions portion of this lecture done. That is by far going to be the largest bit, but it's also going to be the most that you'll be assessed on. So a summary is that cortical lesions have cortical signs. Awesome. Learn the anatomy of the brain, learn what each lobe does, then learn how the blood supply is to each area of the brain. It'll make sense. Capsular lesions, upper and lower motor, upper and lower limb signs are equal, um, but there's no cortical signs. Learn the blood supply, learn the anatomy. Brainstem, learn the syndromes. The pons has facial nerve signs, the medulla doesn't. Weber's syndrome has oculomotor nerve palsy. Spinal cord, be aware of brown squidward, central cord, anterior and posterior. Peripheral nerves, make sure you know everything about ulna, median, radial nerve palsy uh, at different levels. Make sure you know foot drop and everything else. Um, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> okay, we're now on to Parkinson's. So, basal ganglia dysfunction. Don't worry about learning the physiology of the basal ganglia. Uh, don't draw out the direct and indirect pathways and the you know neurotransmitters of each. Our group did that and it was such a waste of time. Just go to the beach and enjoy your life or something. It's not worth it. Anyway, the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease. It's a neurodegenerative disease with accumulation and aggregation of proteins <clears throat> which interfere in the function of neurons, including the mitochondria of those neurons. If you lose the neurons of the substantia nigra, 
which are typically the target in Parkinson's, you no longer release dopamine onto the basal ganglia because the nigrostriatal pathway goes from the substantia nigra to the striatum, where the basal ganglia are. It releases dopamine onto there. Basically, and you don't even need to know this much, is that dopamine inhibits the indirect pathway and it excites the direct pathway. The direct pathway is in control of saying yes when you want to move. So I want to move my left arm. The direct pathway says, okay, sounds good, and you can move your arm. The indirect pathway says, hey, don't move. It's not time to move yet, okay? And if you turn that off, whilst also turning on the direct one, you'll be able to move. Now, if you don't have enough dopamine, the balance favors the indirect pathway, okay? The direct pathway isn't stimulated, and the indirect pathway is not inhibited. So that means the indirect pathway is active, whilst the direct pathway is inactive. The net result of that is that movement is inhibited, so you can't move. What does that look like? Well, the basal ganglia dysfunction of Parkinson's depending on what stage you are at in your Parkinson's development, is uh, best remembered with the acronym TRAP. T for tremor, which is a resting tremor, pill rolling tremor typically, and you'll see that one day. Rigidity, uh, lead pipe rigidity is a good one to remember for physical exam. That arm just will not move uh, when you go to test tone. Uh, Akinesia and bradykinesia, so that includes reduced movements of the limbs. Micrographia, which is small handwriting, which is just a smaller version of not being able to move your limbs, right? Because you need to move your fingers to write, um, or your wrist, I guess. Serpentine stare, you don't move your eyelids as much, so you blink slowly and not as often, so you look like a snake. Uh, and speech becomes very quiet and soft, and you have difficulty swallowing. All of that is from not being able to move your muscles enough. Postural instability. You've got a stooped uh, stance with a shuffling gait. So try and remember that. Now, <laughs> I always thought Parkinson's was about having this shaky tremor, right? Like moving too much. But Parkinson's as a disease is actually not being able to move, okay? You, you're basically like a statue. Your indirect pathway is too powerful and you're not able to initiate movement. The reason people get that tremor and the very severe excess motor movement is actually a side effect of L-DOPA, the treatment for Parkinson's, okay? And because you have never seen a person with untreated Parkinson's, your mind from media and whatever else thinks that Parkinson's is actually a, you know, this massive tremor. But actually the only tremor is the pill rolling tremor. Okay? But the big tremor of Parkinson's is actually a late stage effect from using L-DOPA. Uh, I found that really interesting. Now, that's not necessarily true for everyone, and I know there are different subtypes of Parkinson's, but generally speaking, Parkinson's is a disease of too little movement, okay? And then treating Parkinson's is what results in those sort of, you know, dystonias, excess movements. So how do you treat Parkinson's? The sort of first line, or depending on how old you are, which this is a, you know, a specialist area, too complex for us, but the, the treatment to know is L-DOPA with carbidopa. Levodopa is converted to dopamine in the brain via dopa decarboxylase, but you also have dopa decarboxylase in the peripheral um, body outside the brain. And if levodopa was converted to dopamine outside of the brain, it wouldn't be able to get in through the blood-brain barrier, and so you would be wasting a lot of that dopamine. So carbidopa, which is an inhibitor of dopa decarboxylase, is given with the levodopa to ensure that the carbidopa isn't uh, turned into dopamine outside the brain, and all that 
levodopa gets into the brain where it can be converted into dopamine because carbidopa can't cross the blood-brain barrier. Okay, so peripheral conversion is inhibited by carbidopa so that the levodopa you give will be centrally converted to dopamine to get the maximum amount of dopamine into the brain. What does that dopamine do? Well, it stimulates the direct pathway and it blocks the indirect pathway, which means that now the balance of yes or no in terms of whether you're allowed to move or not falls towards yes. The direct pathway is now able to overpower the indirect pathway and allows you to move. You might end up moving too much, which is a side effect. And that's the you know, excessive movement that we stereotypically think of for Parkinson's. Alternatively, you could use a dopamine agonist or a monoamine oxidase B inhibitor, which prevents the breakdown of dopamine. So all of those will result in more dopamine activity in the basal ganglia to promote movement and to get rid of that rigidity and allow symptomatic relief of Parkinson's. The other drug that uh, it's sort of an it was the, the very first therapy for Parkinson's and may or may not be of use anymore is a uh, anticholinergic, so a drug that blocks acetylcholine receptors. This has nothing to do with the skeletal muscle, neuromuscular junction, you know, those receptors. It has nothing to do with the autonomic nervous system, muscarinic receptors, nicotinic receptors, all of that. This is about in the brain that dopamine normally, as a bit of extra neurophysiology, it blocks the release of acetylcholine onto the basal ganglia. When you lose dopamine, you've now got too much acetylcholine going onto the basal ganglia, and that also inhibits movement. So by blocking the activity of acetylcholine in the basal ganglia, you restore the normal function, right? Normally dopamine would stop acetylcholine being released, but now dopamine's gone and there's too much acetylcholine. The only other thing you can do is just block that acetylcholine. Okay. Here's a little bit of real life for you. Um, good luck. Uh, also be aware of deep brain stimulation. If you stimulate the subthalamic nucleus, you kind of do what levodopa does, but electrically. Okay. Uh, here's my little take on Parkinson's is that this is a progressive disease with significant morbidity. Uh, you need input from OT, physio, dietitian, speech path, home care, and eventually um, some kind of institutional care, and that the response to medication is limited in the long term, and that there's even some thought that L-DOPA actually speeds up degeneration of the substantia nigra, um, but don't quote me on that. So that's quite depressing, and I must admit, of all the times I've felt depressed in my life, BMB would have been the most depressing because, you know, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, stroke, Lewy body dementia, Pick's disease, it's a lot of morbidity without very much hope, I guess. But the, the, the thing that I hope for anyone else who feels the same way when they study neurology is to remember that medicine is holistic it's art plus science, and uh, when you, <laughs> this is probably a little bit too poetic, but when you're faced with the abyss of conditions such as Parkinson's, you need to do your best and be human. You can't offer much in the way of science uh, in terms of treatment and cures, but you can give them a glass of water and have a conversation. Um, you might be the only person this patient talks to all day long, and creating happiness for that person must be a goal of treatment uh, because at the end of the day, they have to live their life and you may not be able to help them medically, but you can help them in a spiritual sense, I guess. Um, that's sort of the same mindset you should take into your aged care and cancer care is that, you know, in someone with terminal cancer, the most important thing is to make sure that they had a nice day you know? Okay.
Lewy body dementia. Um, it's Parkinson's, but with visual hallucinations much earlier on. The Lewy bodies accumulate throughout the cortex. They're actually made out of alpha synuclein too, I believe. So it's just, it's basically Parkinson's, but the accumulation of protein is in areas other than the substantia nigra. Um, it, and it also comes along with dementia hallucinations, especially visual hallucinations. Okay. Tremors. So you can have an action or a rest tremor, and an action tremor can be postural or it can be uh, kinetic. So postural means if I try to hold my hand up, even though I'm not actually moving my hand, I will start to have a tremor because I'm engaging my muscles to keep my hand still against gravity. Compare that to rest, where if I just put the, my arm down on a table and it starts shaking, that's a different kind of tremor. And then a kinetic tremor is if I tried to reach out and grab something, I would then start shaking, which is more active compared to the postural tremor. Here's a um, emboss table to summarize tremors. Just have a good idea about them. Huntington's disease, another uh, striatal issue. Um, there is 13 from House. That is a fictional character, but whatever. CAG, trinucleotide repeats, that's your buzzword for the exam. Uh, anticipation, which is the concept that with each generation the disease will come on earlier, so you're kind of anticipating it with each generation. It's autosomal dominant, and essentially the, the, the stuff produced from these CAG, trinucleotide repeats, results in damage to the basal ganglia, but in this case, it actually damages the parts of the basal ganglia that look after the indirect pathway. So you lose your ability to inhibit uncontrolled movement. So you end up with career, fidgetiness, and also an eventual dementia. And in the long term, it becomes like Parkinsonism, where you don't move as much. Tourette's syndrome, they don't know very much about it, but just be aware of coprolalia, echolalia, and palilalia. Essential tremor, just be aware that it's a thing. And here's a table comparing Parkinson's to essential tremor. Wilson's disease, just be aware of um, that this is a disease to do with copper transport. You end up with too much copper in the liver and in the brain. In the liver, it leads to hepatitis and cirrhosis. And in the brain, it leads to cognitive impairment and uncontrolled sort of basal ganglia dysfunction movement. Uh, so in someone with liver disease plus neurological signs with motor impairment that looks like basal ganglia kind of signs, consider Wilson's. Okay, done. Now we've taken up quite a long time uh, just getting through the beginning of this lecture. So for the next things I'm gonna be speeding through, but I do encourage you to sit down with the slides and really have a go at understanding each concept in detail. What is a seizure? It's uncontrolled excitatory neuronal electrical activity. If you go to this website, it'll teach you how to classify a seizure um, with the IL, the league <laughs> um, classification, which classifies the seizure, the epilepsy, the syndrome, and the etiology. Be aware of this table, which I've taken from Harry McConnell's lecture, which he's taken from Google. Uh, in that you can have a focal seizure or a generalized seizure, that awareness is either impaired or not impaired or you know intact, and that it's motor or non-motor, or a generalized motor or non-motor. Just also be aware of this idea of a focal to bilateral tonic-clonic seizure. So in someone who has focal aware motor seizures, they might just have jerky movements of one limb, but they have intact awareness during that seizure, like a myoclonic jerk, for example. Here's a diagram summarizing anti-epileptics. Um, don't worry too much about it. The pharmacology is just too much for you to remember. Um, if you want to remember anything, remember valproate and phenytoin. Um, they both inhibit sodium channels voltage-gated sodium channels, preventing action potentials traveling down the neuron. You've got Kepra here, Levetiricetam, 
which prevents the function of these synapses to stop the release of glutamate, which is the excitatory neurotransmitter. You've got benzos, which um, potentiate the GABA receptor to inhibit neurons, um, and many others. Ethosuximide is used a lot for absence seizures. There's, you know, cool. <laughs> Lamotrigine, sodium. Okay. Skull fractures. Not going to go through this in detail, but just make sure you know the stuff on this slide. And this. Okay. Brain injury. Just be aware of the idea of coup and counter coup or contra coup. Um, and that there's two models, which is the sort of positive pressure, negative pressure thing, or the acceleration, deceleration. And that those are primary injuries from the actual physical damage. And then there's secondary injury from the metabolites and excitotoxicity from glutamate. And just for third year, be aware of syndrome of inappropriate ADH and cerebral salt wasting as um, things that happen in people who get head trauma. SIADH you should know very well for your MCQ exams. Intracranial bleeds. So again, we're not going to go through the anatomy in detail, but just be aware. Um, extradural hemorrhage, younger people, skull fractures, especially to the terion, involving the middle meningeal artery, but it can also be from a dural venous sinus tear. You get bleeding into the extradural space, which is the space between the cranial bone and the endosteal dura mater. So it's actually a bubble of blood between the bone and the endosteal dura mater from either cutting this meningeal artery or from cutting the dural venous sinus and then having it bleed up into the bone. Subdural hemorrhage, though, is in older people, and it's typically from a tear of the bridging veins, or again, um, a dural venous tear that bleeds down. Um, and this is the one that characteristically has a lucid interval, where you lose consciousness from the initial impact, um, and then you wake up, and then suddenly blood collects, and you pass out again. It's crescent-shaped, and it crosses suture lines, whereas extradural hemorrhage, because the endosteal dura mater goes up into the sutures, it's confined to the suture lines, and it's a biconvex shape. Finally, subarachnoid hemorrhage is when the cerebral artery bleeds into one of the cisterns, um, for example, a berry aneurysm or an arteriovenous malformation, and you get a lot of signs to do with having blood in the CSF and irritation of the meninges. You've got severe sudden thunderclap headache, loss of consciousness, neck stiffness, and Koenig's sign and Brodzinski's signs, which are two signs of meningism that you need to know one day, um, as well as focal neurological signs and seizures and nausea and vomiting. Hydrocephalus will occur, secondary to blocked CSF drainage. You'll have increased ICP and brain herniation. Um, and xanthochromia on lumbar puncture is the presence of broken down red blood cells in the CSF. So that's a bleed of um, a cerebral artery into the subarachnoid space collecting within a cistern. Okay, so have a look at this CT. Uh, it's a CT scan of the cranium. It shows on the right side a biconvex collection, which is hyperdense compared to CSF. So it's white, whereas CSF is black. So it's not CSF. Um, it's very dense, so it's a big, dense collection of blood. Okay, this is an extradural hemorrhage confined to suture lines, and it's a biconvex shape. Here, you've got um, the ventricles. You can see that the left ventricle has been obliterated, and the midline of the brain has been shifted to the right, and there's a collection which is dense compared to CSF, so it's not CSF, it must be blood, um, and it's collecting in a large crescent shape and it crosses suture lines. This is your subdural hemorrhage, the one where the bridging veins are torn. Here you have a subarachnoid hemorrhage with uh, dense fluid, uh, you know, 
it's denser than CSF, it's not black, so it's blood, and it's collecting in the supracellar cistern <clears throat> as well as others. Okay, so extradural hemorrhage, biconvex bleed um, from a middle meningeal artery, for example. Subdural hematoma, um, for example, from tearing the bridging veins in an old alcoholic. Um, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, collection of blood within the cisterns from rupture of a cerebral artery. Okay, we've now sort of finished the big neurology topics. Let's just quickly cover uh, some other neurology things before moving on to musculoskeletal and psychiatry. Cerebral palsy. You don't need to understand it in detail but it's an upper motor neuron sort of lesion in the sense that it's damaged to the brain itself, and it can be spastic or non-spastic. The signs uh, in a baby are the persistence of primitive reflexes. Um, you'll learn these in third year, um, but essentially there are reflexes that a baby has when they're born and they're meant to go away, but they will stay. Their presence in sort of older kids will be toe walking, hypotonia, and scissor gait, which is, um, have, have a look on YouTube. And then you've got non-spastic, which is more rare, um, and chorioathetoid dyskinetic cerebral palsy was quite common in the past due to something called kernicterus, which is from having jaundice as a baby, um, but it's quite rare now because of jaundice protocols. So cerebral palsy, it's an umbrella term for lots of motor disorders of children, um, it's the most common physical disability in childhood, so it's worth knowing what it is, um, but it's not really examined a lot this year. Just to prepare you for paediatrics in third year, um, some of the causes in infants that will eventually lead to cerebral palsy are for premature infants, which is less than 37 weeks gestation, uh, they can have an intraventricular hemorrhage which is a bleed into the ventricle, um, and there's grades one to four for that. Don't need to know that yet. Um, but an early consequence is hydrocephalus. That's bad on its own. But a late consequence is this thing called periventricular leukomalacia, PVL. Children with PVL have a high risk of developing cerebral palsy later in life. So that's one cause to be aware of. And then neonatal jaundice, um, it can either be pathological or physiological, and the causes, just like in an adult, are prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic. And unconjugated bilirubin, which is fat soluble, accumulates in the brain, especially the basal ganglia, and leads to kernicterus, which once upon a time was a common cause of chorioathetoid non-spastic cerebral palsy. So just so that you've heard these terms, I thought it might be good for us to go through them. Torch infections. These are other causes of congenital abnormalities in children, and it stands for toxoplasmosis, others, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and herpes. Um, this can also lead to cerebral palsy as well as other congenital anomalies. Okay, a little bit of advice about musculoskeletal medicine. So I'm not going to go through the anatomy stuff in detail, but from a philosophical point of view, here's just some advice. You should learn the anatomy as best as you can. And for each joint, you should imagine the bones, the ligaments, the bursa, the muscles, the vessels, the nerves that are all around it. And then start learning the diseases, so fractures and dislocations, and just try put it all together. And the more you jump back and forwards between the anatomy and the disease, each one will become more cemented in your mind. So the more you learn about shoulder dislocation, the more you will remember the coracochromial ligament or whatever, you know? Um, so I hope that, just, just keep that in mind that if one thing doesn't make sense at first, just do the other thing for a while. And when you come back, the initial thing will make more sense. So. If the anatomy of the shoulder girdle doesn't make sense, just start learning what a clavicle fracture is, and then you'll come back and the anatomy will be easier, I guarantee you. Um, 
yeah, so put it all together, understand the consequences of damaging each structure, um, and then I've just given a summary of some of the things that come up in anatomy. Uh, this is my little cheat. So one exam question from you know my imagination could be, how does a person with a fractured femur present compared to someone with a dislocated hip? Well, the word fracture has an E in it, and so the hip is E externally rotated, and dislocation has an I in it, and so it's internally rotated. Um, and that's for posterior hip dislocation, the most common kind of dislocation. Some lower limb conditions, uh, some ex hints for the anatomy exam. For physical examination in MSK, it's just four steps. It's so easy. Like the books make it look really hard, but in reality, it's quite easy. You look, you palpate, you move. And then you do special tests, and the knee has the most special tests. I would recommend you know the knee exam really well. Um, for the limb, for the uh, upper limb nerve lesions, and also the lower limb, if you are struggling to learn about the uh, hand muscles like FDP and all of that. Um, that just tells you that I don't remember any of them. Um, the best way I found to actually learn them is to focus on learning the signs of, say, an ulnar nerve lesion. And then when you come back to learn the anatomy, because you've looked at these muscles in the context of an ulnar nerve lesion, you'll actually remember it really well. So again, if one thing, you know, the anatomy you're struggling with, go and learn about the pathology. And then when you come back, the anatomy will be easier and just keep jumping between the two and eventually it'll be natural. Some myotomes for you to remember, biceps jerk C5, C6, triceps jerk C7, C8, maybe also C6, maybe not even C8, just depends where you read, knee jerk L3, L4, ankle jerk S1, S2. Ankle jerk's really good to remember because when we talked about central cord syndrome, I said that there was a thing called sacral sparing where all the sacral nerves aren't affected. So ankle jerk will be normal, but biceps jerk with these cervical nerve roots, that will be impaired. It'll be like a upper motor neuron issue there perhaps, okay? Um, or a lower motor neuron if the damage is at the level of C5 or C6, whereas the ankle jerk will just be normal. Uh, dermatome versus myotome. So a dermatome is the area of skin uh, supplied by a single spinal, spinal nerve root, whereas a myotome is the group of muscles innervated by a single nerve root. Um, just be aware of those and know the embryology as best as you can uh, as where these somites come from. The sclerotome is the vertebra at that level, basically. Okay, psychiatry. Mental state exam, um, you know, it may or may not be an OSCE station in year two, but it most likely will be one in either year three or year four. One mnemonic to remember it is aseptic, and so it's appearance, behavior, speech, and so on. Um, another one given to us in the lecture last year was act mad I, same, same things. It's really important um, for third year that you're able to do this easily because it's uh, what they do all the time. Okay, now psych is basically just a memory game. There's not a lot of deep understanding required um, and the multi-choice questions are quite obvious in second year, so don't stress too much about psych. But basically you've got mood disorders, psychosis, anxiety, and then some other things. For mood disorders, there's depression, which here's the DSM criteria. We won't go through them, but at least one has to be these first two. And then you need to have uh, four more that are from the others. And then specifically, there's some subtypes of depression. Just be aware of psychotic depression because that comes up in MCQs a decent amount with someone who's severely depressed and they start having auditory hallucinations that are mood congruent. 
that sounds a lot like psychotic depression. Um, does the person ever hallucinate when their mood symptoms are not present? In such a case, you should consider schizoaffective disorder. Okay, so in psychotic depression, they've got baseline depression, which when it gets really bad, they start to hallucinate, typically auditory mood congruent hallucinations. Uh, but in schizoaffective disorder, they have psychosis, so delusions, hallucinations, all of that, um, typically, and then every so often they fall into a state of extremely low mood. Okay, so do you see the difference? I hope so. Antidepressants. Uh, let, we won't go through it, but you know, make sure you know what an SSRI, SNRI, Mayo, TCA is, um, as well as the concepts of electroconvulsive therapy and transcranial magnetic stimulation, just, just to be aware of it. Um, but more importantly, uh, be aware that uh, Treatment begins with therapy and exercise and diet and, you know, socializing um, and then eventually involves medications. And that's described really well in the AMH as well as the ETG. Um, and here's a diagram uh, from Goodman and Gilman's that sort of summarizes how these work. Um, you know, the hypothesis behind depression is complex, um, and I wouldn't worry too much about understanding exactly how depression works, but just be aware that it's not just a serotonin deficiency, okay? Just be aware. <laughs> Mania. So you can have a manic episode, which lasts for a week and really gets in the way of your day-to-day -day life and has some of these characteristics, okay? three or more, uh, whereas a hypomanic episode doesn't get in the way of your, your social life, um, and it's only for four days, um, and again has three of these or more. So the typical story here is a guy locks himself in his garage and starts working on his car for three days straight, and he doesn't sleep because he doesn't feel like he needs to sleep, and then he goes to the casino because he knows that he's going to win. Um, and he, you know, puts down his mortgage for a roulette game or something. Bipolar 1 and 2. Um, so bipolar 1, you've got episodes of major depression with at least one manic episode. Bipolar 2, you've got major depression with at least a hypomanic episode. Um, and why do we treat bipolar? Because we want to prevent mania and we want to help depression, and we want to stop mania from coming back. Mania is a serious medical emergency. Like, you can ruin your life during a manic episode, and there's a lot of lawsuits involved if doctors fail to prevent mania. Um, I won't go into the pharmacology, but basically you've got mood stabilizers for long-term maintenance, as well as acute drugs that can get you out of mania. The drug to know in detail is lithium, but uh, anti-epileptic drugs can also help. Basically, just think of mania as a sort of seizure in a way, as it's too much activity going on in a certain part of the brain. And so anti-epileptics can turn off that part of the brain from firing too much and make the mania stop. And I'm sure if you're a neuroscientist, you'd hate what I just said, because I'm sure it's not accurate, but it's one way to remember it. Antipsychotics can be used for acute mania. Um, quetiapine will put you to sleep because it acts on histamine receptors. Um, yeah. Lithium, be aware that they don't really understand how it works, to be honest, um, to be truly honest. Uh, but just be aware of uh, that it can be used for treatment resistant depression in third year and that it has toxicity. It's got its own toxidrome that you should learn, um, maybe not now, but maybe for next year, and that you need to take regular blood tests to make sure it doesn't reach that toxic level. It's also toxic to the kidneys, and it's a cause of um, diabetes insipidus, uh, but at the level of the kidney, okay? Which means that 
uh, ADH isn't working and you're peeing too much water out. Psychosis, five domains and you've got an abnormality in one or more of them. Psychosis is kind of like a syndrome. Um, it's not a diagnosis, it's just kind of a state of being. And then specific diagnoses have psychosis as one of their features. Delusions, hallucinations, thought disorder, motor signs, and negative symptoms. Delusions. Uh, they're fixed beliefs that are not amenable to change in light of conflicting evidence. And there's specific ones. Um, erotomanic comes up quite a lot. Um, as well as persecutory. Bizarre versus non-bizarre would be good to understand. So a bizarre delusion is impossible. So aliens took your liver and then no one else is allowed to know that because they didn't leave a scar. Um, whereas non-bizarre is like, oh, the police are watching me. Um, and it's, it's totally possible because police exist and they can watch you. <laughs> uh, and hallucinations can be from all of the senses. So, you know, auditory, visual, taste, smell, touch, um, but typically auditory hallucinations for schizophrenia, visual hallucinations for drug abuse, um, tactile hallucinations with amphetamines. You might feel like things crawling on your skin. Um, and if you hallucinate when you're falling asleep or waking up, it's all good, <laughs> um, you know, probably. But, you know, I think a lot of us may have had that before where you hear someone calling your name or something like that as you're falling asleep. It's okay. Thought disorder. So um, disorganized thinking with loose associations. You can have um, linear thoughts or you can have tangential or circumstantial or... Uh, word salad. Um, it kind of gets worse and worse, but just be aware that, you know, there is a thing called thought disorder. There's also specific concepts to do with thoughts where you can have thought insertion, where someone puts a th thought in your mind. You can have thought withdrawal, where they've taken it away from you. Thought block, where you're in the middle of talking to someone and they stop talking like that. Um, or uh, thought broadcasting, where other people can hear your thoughts. Motor behavior, including catatonia, just be aware that it's one of the features, and negative symptoms. So uh, it looks a lot like depression, basically. Anhedonia, not talking, not wanting to do anything, flat affect, asocial. Um, so specific disorders, delusional disorder um, is when you've had a delusion for more than a month, but it's not schizophrenia and it's not explained by substance use. So you could, for example, have persecutory delusional disorder where you've had persecutory delusions for a long time, but you've not got schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, on the other hand, uh, here's the DSM criteria is when you've had two or more of the domains having symptoms for more than a month, and overall it has to be at least six months to be called schizophrenia, otherwise it's just schizophreniform. In practice though, um, someone with these symptoms will typically be uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia, and then their diagnosis will be revised if they improve independently in less than six months, basically. Because uh, what are you going to do? Schizo, schizophreniform goes away on its own, but how on earth would you possibly know that that's going to happen? You, you know, you can't just not medicate a person in full-blown psychosis and just say, oh, well, we'll wait six months in case this isn't schizophrenia. Schizoaffective disorder is essentially baseline psychosis with mood episodes. Um, so it's sort of the inverse of psychotic depression. And psychosis has a lot of organic causes that are independent of all these psychiatric diagnoses. Um, so it can be a metabolic disorder, it can be substance use, epilepsy, especially temporal lobe epilepsy, 
um, in the limbic system, if you've got a lot of electrical activity going on, a lot of weird things will start happening. And it's not schizophrenia. Um, you know, neurosyphilis was a big one back in the day. The treatment of psychosis, we won't go into too much detail, um, but please see the AMH and the ETG. But basically, the theory is that there's too much dopamine activity in the mesolimbic pathway, which is where there are D2 receptors, and there's not enough dopamine activity in the mesocortical pathway. So too much mesolimbic gives you positive symptoms of delusions, hallucinations, but not enough mesocortical activity gives you negative symptoms, the you know depressive sort of symptoms, the lack of cognitive function, thought disorder. Uh, all effective antipsychotics block the D2 receptors in order to get rid of those positive symptoms. And sometimes that might even make the negative symptoms worse if it blocks the D1 receptors of the mesocortical pathway. Some side effects to always have in the back of your mind are extrapyramidal side effects because essentially if you're blocking dopamine receptors you're going to end up blocking them in the nigrostriatal pathway and you're essentially giving someone uh, Parkinson's in a way you know you're interfering with the activity of dopamine in the basal ganglia so acute dystonias are acute reactions that come on sort of in the short term um, and their extrapyramidal ocular gyric crisis, etc. But a chronic effect of blocking dopamine uh, and the use of antipsychotics is something like tardive dyskinesia, um, which is worth looking up, and it's on the AMH too. Uh, because dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin in the tuberohypophyseal pathway, uh, you can get galactorrhea, you can have sexual dysfunction. You can have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hyperglycemia, especially with the atypical antipsychotics, which are associated with weight gain, um, long QT syndrome. And one good one to remember is that clozapine uh, has a 1 to 2 percent risk of agranulocytosis, and that's incredibly high uh, a risk, so they need regular blood monitoring. Um, and the other one to know is neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is a kind of like a toxidrome specific to the use of antipsychotics. Now, from a philosophical point of view, it's important to consider that in the patient with psychosis, they need to take their medications to live a normal life. But having a normal life uh, typically, you know, requires you not to have galactorrhea, extrapyramidal side effects, sex, sexual dysfunction, and cardiovascular disease. So, it's important to consider from a human point of view that these medications may actually have very poor compliance because of their side effects. And that needs to be discussed in a lot of detail in a very sort of motivational interviewing kind of way, because, you know, you once a person is stabilized under the Mental Health Act, you can't force them to take these medications. Um, so they need to see the benefits and decide for themselves that the benefits outweigh the negatives, which, you know, for someone who's trying to have a relationship, um, it, it would make life difficult having to take these medications. Um, and here's a summary of everything that you need to know about antipsychotics. Go to this article in the AMH. Here are some slides I stole from Rhys Harris. Uh, and Wadia um, from the GUMS Year 3 lecture. So just a little bit about anxiety disorders. So the difference between fear and anxiety is that fear is uh, a normal, you know, physiological response, whereas anxiety is sort of fear out of proportion to the stimulus, sometimes even without a stimulus, just the concept of a stimulus, okay? So an anxiety disorder is kind of the uh, a natural process that's gone out of control in a sense. So generalized anxiety disorder, you've got issues with concentration, irritability, muscle tension, exhaustion, restlessness, sleep. Sleep disorder in anxiety 
typically people have trouble getting to sleep, whereas in depression, they have early morning awakening. Just be aware of that little pearl. Panic disorder uh, is recurrent panic attacks, and a panic attack is basically just the sympathetic nervous system uh, exploding. Um, so if you ever need to make up the signs and symptoms of a panic attack, just think of what the sympathetic nervous system does to the skin, to the heart, to the uh, lungs, etc. Uh, just some definitions of phobia um, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, make sure you have a rough idea of obsessions versus compulsions. PTSD, which is um, no longer an anxiety disorder. Uh, be aware of flashbacks. So that's very unique. You don't really get that in anxiety disorders. So say you were involved in a violent attack and you're walking down the street, you might start visually seeing the attack happen again or hear it happen again. Um, that's unique to PTSD and avoidance behavior. Um, as well as mood symptoms, okay? Hypervigilance, avoidance, flashbacks, depression, hard. Treatment for all anxiety disorders involves therapy. Uh, CBT is sort of the highest in terms of evidence these days, um, but there's obviously other interventions, greater desensitization. So if you're afraid of going in the elevator, I might show you a picture of an elevator and then I might show you a picture of someone in an elevator, and then we might go stand outside the elevator, and then we might go stand inside the elevator but not press any buttons, so on and so forth, until one day you feel comfortable getting in an elevator because you gradually desensitized yourself to all the aspects of that elevator. Uh, in a sense, that's how medical school works, in that you do comm skills over and over again, beginning with very easy scenarios and finishing with hard scenarios, and one day seeing real patients, that's a greater desensitization to make you comfortable with medicine. Um, in the anxiety PBL case, they discuss benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines have a role in anxiety treatment, but long-term use of benzodiazepines is uh, not wise. It ruins lives, um, but that being said, I've seen plenty of people in the hospital who have been on them for decades, so it's still a rampant issue uh, in that, you know, you can kind of understand that if someone's been on benzos for 20 years and they're getting on well as their GP, it's a very difficult conversation to jump in and say, hey, do you want to try not take the thing that makes it all better? Because the guidelines tell me that you shouldn't take it anymore. That's a hard conversation. Um, and obviously the evidence weighs in that, you know, long-term benzodiazepine use isn't good, but the practical reality of that, I think is gonna take quite a while to manifest in practice. Um, but here's the RSCGP guidelines on that. If you've got a specific question about anything to do with benzodiazepines, this massive 100-page document will have the answer for you. And it's, it's a beautiful document. Uh, addiction. So this is a rat brain. Um, just to remind you that the addiction is a physical thing, not just sort of a psychological thing. Um, also be aware of all those definitions of um, receptor tachyphylaxis, uh, tolerance, addiction, withdrawal, etc. Um, but we're talking about addiction here specifically, which is kind of the physical and mental combination. Uh, you've got the VTA neurons, which release dopamine onto the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens then release opioids, which generate pleasure. So when you eat chocolate, you feel pleasure, and that cycle repeats, and it ensures that you keep eating. Um, you know, sleep. Uh, everything that's important for your survival is reinforced by this mechanism, but certain drugs hijack this mechanism, and so your brain feels like the only way to survive is to keep having those substances. Alcohol, cocaine, heroin, nicotine, everything, 
has some relationship to this axis. Um, this is sort of low yield, but just be aware that there's three stages of um, addiction and they kind of cycle. So you take the substance, you get the whole VTA um, nucleus accumbens thing, which makes you feel good. That's your intoxication stage. Then when you're not taking the substance, your prefrontal cortex is sitting there going, hmm, should we take it or shouldn't we take it? I really want to take it. You're preoccupied thinking about the substance. And then you go into withdrawal, and that's the amygdala. And it, you feel like you're about to die if you don't get the substance. You're having a panic attack. So then you take the substance again. Um, and each time you go through this cycle, perhaps you'll need a higher dose of the substance to maintain normal function. And that's the vicious cycle of opioid addiction, of um, benzodiazepine addiction, essentially. The other thing to consider is that something like benzodiazepines, they cause baseline inhibition of your neuronal activity, which your brain then adapts to. So then if you take the benzodiazepines away, the brain really suffers because it's adapted to what it's like to be constantly exposed to benzodiazepines. So withdrawal from all of these substances is really complex um, and can be aided by certain pharmacological uh, agents as well as um, either inpatient or outpatient detox uh, programs. Okay, that is basically the end of psychiatry and neurology, except for a little bit on dementia and delirium at the end. Now let's talk about bones, joints, and muscles. Fractures. This is from Dr. Petku's lectures. Um, for this section, I've stolen some images from rheumatology lectures from Dr. Jenny and Dr. Petku's lectures for bone pathology. Um, and I'll do my best to point that out whenever I come upon a picture. So this is his slide. Um, just be aware of these fractures. Know what a spiral fracture is, a uh, green stick fracture, for example. Know the stages of fracture healing. Um, and the easiest way to remember this is blood goes to soft stuff, goes to harder stuff, goes to harder stuff, and then the really hard stuff turns into bone and then it gets remodeled. Okay, so we go from liquid to solid, from soft to hard, from blood to fibrous to bone. That's just my way of remembering it because it's always a multi-choice. It's not really a short answer question um, as far as I've seen. Osteomyelitis. It can be acute or chronic. Untreated acute osteomyelitis becomes chronic osteomyelitis. It can be pyogenic, tuberculous, or like spirochetes and stuff. But the one we care about is pyogenic in Australia, um, most commonly caused by Staph aureus, but in neonates it can be haemophilus or group B streptococcus. For those using drugs or having a UTI, it could be E. coli, e. coli pseudomonas, or Klebsiella. Um, and for some reason in sickle cell disease, it's often Salmonella. The organisms get to the bone either through the blood or from a site. Uh, so like if the skin is into the bone or if you've um, had an open fracture or you've had an implant, uh, like a hip replacement, um, that can directly seed those bacteria into the bone. The treatment is antibiotics and surgical debridement. Osteonecrosis, you should be aware of avascular necrosis. Um, but also just be aware that corticosteroids can cause it as well, and some other medical conditions. And the femoral head avascular necrosis is the main one in the PBL case, but just also be aware of avascular necrosis of the proximal segment of the scaphoid bone in a scaphoid fracture. Bronge, bisphosphonate-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. In people taking bisphosphonates, they can get this osteonecrosis of the jaw. It's very rare. The media makes a big fuss about it. Um, but, you know, it's a complex area that should be managed by a specialist. Uh, the advice from the AMH is that you should get all your dental work done before 
uh, giving the bisphosphonate and don't give it to people who have risk factors such as poor oral hygiene or radiotherapy for head and neck cancer. Bone tumors. So the one that you should focus on is metastasis. So most lesions cause osteolytic breakdown of the bone. Prostate cancer is the ex exception where it is actually osteoblastic and breast cancer METs can be a mixture of both. This is an osteolytic lung cancer lesion. Here's a slide, slide from Dr. Petku's lecture summarizing all the benign and malignant growths of bone and cartilage. Um, maybe just be aware of osteosarcoma and uh, chondromas, um, but ultimately it's you know Ewing sarcoma as well. It's, it's a very big, broad area, and it's unclear how much you really need to know. Okay, metabolic bone diseases. So we've got the main ones that we learn are osteoporosis, Paget's disease, and then rickets and osteomalacia. You should be aware of hyperparathyroidism, whether it's primary, for example, from a parathyroid tumor, or secondary. Um, for example, the chronic kidney disease, mineral and bone disease sort of syndrome, uh, which is one worth knowing by the end of p for p Osteoporosis. It's a reduction in the bone mineral density um, and a loss of bone matrix, leading to a deterioration of the architecture of the bone, so it becomes brittle and easily fractured. So there's normal mineralization of the matrix, but there's not enough matrix, okay? And the matrix that is there isn't woven together properly. Um, I don't even know if that's a word. <laughs> uh, so the mineralization's okay. The vitamin D, the calcium, that's okay. It's just the actual matrix that you're depositing those minerals into is not put together very well. And essentially it's too much osteoclast activity and not enough osteoblast activity. Okay, so the bone matrix is, is being resorbed too much and not being laid down properly. So then the mineralized bone is very fragile. Important things to understand is the rank ligand, which binds to rank receptors and causes differentiation of osteoclasts. And this natural antagonist against rank ligand called osteoprotogerin, the ratio of the two determines the balance between osteoclast and osteoblast activity. If you've got too much rank ligand and not enough osteoprotogerin, you'll have too many osteoclasts being activated and too much bone resorption. So bringing balance to this ratio is what controls the balance in bone remodeling. If you have estrogen around, estrogen increases the osteoprotogerin to rank L ratio, it promotes osteoblast activity and causes osteoclast apoptosis. So that's why when you've got estrogen, it protects your bones, but after menopause, without enough estrogen, the ratio favors rank ligand and you've got too many osteoclasts and not enough osteoblasts actively working on the bone. T-scores. The T-score is the standard deviation you are away from a healthy person in terms of bone mineral density at um, the, you know, the hip, the spine, the wrist, etc. Um, and basically osteopenia is one to two and a half and osteoporosis is beyond two and a half. These are some notes from my PBL notes. Um, it's just a summary of the GP guidelines of who to screen for osteoporosis. Um, and the only reason I put this here is just to draw your attention to the um, risk factors such as smoking, um, low body weight. So people who recover from anorexia are at future risk of osteoporosis, significant risk. Um, medical conditions, so anorexia, premature menopause, amenorrhea, uh, you know, multiple myeloma, HIV, and corticosteroid use, just have a rough idea in your mind that, you know, there are medical conditions that make osteoporosis more likely. Um, you know, people with celiac, for example, 
are entitled to a certain number of free screens because of the increased chance they have of getting osteoporosis from deficient absorption of stuff through the gut. Um, and just be aware that it's this dual X-ray absorbed geometry um, X-ray thingy that's a bone mineral density scan. Here's a quick resource, which is what I had summarized, and then a massive document that is everything a GP ever needs to know about osteoporosis. So treatments, bisphosphonates, they promote osteoclast apoptosis and they prevent osteoclasts from sticking to the bone. Um, certain ones do both and certain ones only do the apoptosis part. Essentially, they're a chemical that lines the bone surface. And so when the osteoclast goes to try eat the bone, it eats the chemical and it dies. Estrogens. So HRT for osteoporosis is very controversial. Um, the risk benefit probably says we shouldn't ever give HRT for osteoporosis purposes. Um, but raloxifene, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, it actually stimulates osteoblasts, inhibits osteoclasts, and has negative activity to the breast and the uterus, so it doesn't cause uterine cancer or breast cancer like other estrogen compounds would, um, but it has the benefits to the bone. So that one is favoured in Australia, and the AMH article summarises that really well. Um, parathyroid hormone fragments, which normally parathyroid hormone causes bone resorption, right, to increase blood calcium, but paradoxically, if you just give small doses of parathyroid hormone in sort of timed bursts, you actually, it's anabolic to bone, and it promotes bone formation. And that's a drug called teriparatide. Denosumab is a anti-rank ligand antibody. It's essentially an artificial version of osteoprotogerin. It binds to rank ligand to prevent it from being able to bind to rank. Therefore, you don't have as many osteoclasts being differentiated through rank ligand because denosumab is soaking up all the rank ligand. Uh, here's a diagram summarizing that. So you've got um, the premature osteoclasts here, or the pre-osteoclasts, with their rank receptor in blue and rank ligand in gray, which rank ligand binding would make it become an osteoclast. But you've also got here denosumab, um, which is an antibody that soaks up the rank ligand to prevent it from activating these cells to become osteoclasts. You've got the bigger Y shape here depicting what osteoprotogerin does, which is your natural rank ligand inhibitor. When osteoprotogerin outweighs rank ligand, you uh, favor the breakdown of osteoclasts to look after your bones. Uh, so you're weighing it down in towards bone production and denosumab helps to pull you towards that good ratio. Whereas when you've got low estrogen and you're postmenopausal and without any drugs, you've got osteoprotogerin being less than the rank ligand, and you've got excess osteoclast activity and not enough osteoblast activity, and you favor bone resorption and loss of bone mineral density. I just put this slide here for interest's sake, um, it's unclear whether this is going to pan out or not anymore, um, because I've seen this one pop up for years, uh, and every year it becomes a little less hopeful. But there's a substance in the body called sclerostin, which inhibits the activity of osteoblasts. Um, it's a natural inhibitor, and people with a genetic deficiency of sclerostin, they end up with really thick bones. Um, so if we inhibit sclerostin with, say, an antibody, potentially that will increase the activity of osteoblasts and promote bone uh, deposition. But all the trials currently for sclerostin inhibitors have really bad safety concerns, apparently. So things are slow in that area. Paget's disease. What should you know about Paget's disease? There are three stages, an osteolytic, and then a mixed stage, 
and then an osteoblastic and then an osteosclerotic kind of you know phase that's one combined phase at the end the net effect is that you break down the healthy bone and then you build sort of a poorly put together bone which is very fragile but thick and it's typically will cause enlargement of the face and uh, because of the thickening of the bones um, and because of that you can com compress nerve roots as well as um, cranial nerves leading to deafness and blindness uh, additionally some interesting physiology points are that you end up with excess blood vessels into the pagetic bone um, and so the skin over where that reaction is happening will be warm and because of all that change to your vascular flow you can actually get heart failure from those changes to your circulation so i found that interesting the treatment um, is very symptomatic based bisphosphonates or denosumab can sort of control that activity happening at the bone um, but essentially all you can do is surgery to treat the stenosis just cut out the thick bone um, but mainly there's no cure or anything like that. Rickets and osteomalacia are the same disease, just in different populations. So they're both vitamin D deficiency, either from having a deficiency of production or a resistance to the activity of vitamin D at the level of the receptor. And ultimately it leads to abnormal bone mineralization. So you've got a normal bone matrix this time, unlike osteoporosis, but the calcium phosphate minerals being deposited on that matrix aren't being mineralized properly because you need vitamin D to aid in maintaining normal calcium and promoting bone mineralization. Because uh, young children have a lot of cartilage in their bones, the, you know, the growth plates aren't fused, if you fail to mineralize that early young bone, you'll end up with bowed legs. Um, because the the cartilage if it's soft will will bend whereas in adults their bones have already grown straight and fused that way it's just now the bones get softer and softer every year um, due to the lack of vitamin d so that's rickets and osteomalacia chronic kidney disease mineral bone disease uh, is essentially a secondary hyperparathyroidism where the failing kidney in chronic kidney disease is unable to activate vitamin D. And because of that, you don't maintain adequate levels of calcium and you also hold on to phosphate because the kidney is unable to excrete phosphate. Together, that triggers parathyroid hormone release. And then parathyroid hormone promotes osteoclast activity and causes bone breakdown. Um, so that's this disease, also known as renal osteodystrophy. The treatment is more or less dialysis. You know, if you can get the calcium levels back to normal and get the phosphate out, you will reduce parathyroid hormone release and prevent bone breakdown. Here's a little summary of that. So having low calcium and high phosphate will result in high parathyroid hormone levels, which causes bone breakdown. Here's a AMBOS summary table of all the blood markers of these different metabolic bone diseases. Um, and you should try be aware of this, that osteoporosis has normal levels of everything, whereas uh, osteomalacia has low calcium and Paget's also has everything normal, but with a really high serum alkaline phosphatase, as well as some other specific markers of bone turnover. Um, so I wanted to bring to your attention some slides from Dr. Jenny's rheumatology le lecture. Um, she summarizes a rheumatological history and the rheumatological conditions really, really well. So if that lecture hasn't been done yet, I really advise that you go to it or, uh, you know, attend it online. <laughs> um, so the, the five points of a rheumatological assessment, they involve number one, is it involving the joint or not? Number two, is the joint inflamed or not? Number three, acute or chronic. Number four, the pattern, which has four S's. 
And number five, what are the associated symptoms? So let's talk about that. Um, this is from her slide, which she's taken from a journal article. Um, but essentially, you know, if, if it's a joint pain, you'll feel pain uh, over the joint line and, you know, pain at all ranges of motion. But if it's not from the joint, it'll be sort of the muscle or the tendon that hurts, and it will only be at certain points where it hurts. Um, inflammatory or non-inflammatory, there are three factors of inflammation, and that's pain, stiffness, and swelling. Just say that to yourself over and over again. Inflammatory arthritis, there's pain at rest, there's stiffness in the morning for more than an hour, and it's swollen, warm, erythematous, inflammatory swelling. Whereas non-inflammatory arthritis, the pain is made worse with certain activities, for example, walking for hip osteoarthritis. The stiffness is short, lived in the morning, less than half an hour. And the swelling is typically a bony swelling from like Hebiden's nodules. Um, it's non-tender swelling and there's not erythema typically. Acute versus chronic, um, the, the difference is, a, you know, six weeks, we'll say. Um, acute arthritis is something like septic arthritis or an episode of gout, which can be acute on chronic, um, or the beginning of rheumatoid arthritis. You know, someone comes in and says, hey, my joints have hurt for three days. Uh, but there's no way for you to know if that's going to actually be chronic because it hasn't been six weeks yet. But, you know. Yeah, uh, whereas genuinely chronic arthritis is either the inflammatory or the non-inflammatory arthritis, um, you know, most important being rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis. The pattern of involvement, the symmetry, the size, the sum, and whether the spine's involved, the four S's. So uh, important to think, you know, is it symmetrical? So are both sides of the body relatively affected the same, or is it just their left knee? Uh, the size, is it the small joints of the hands, or is it the big weight-bearing joints like in osteo? Uh, is it a mono? So if you had sort of a um, asymmetrical large joint monoarthropathy of the knee that was erythematous and acute onset without involvement of the spine, that would sound a lot like a septic arthritis of the knee, um, especially if they're a kid who's just been playing out in the garden. Whereas a symmetrical um, small joint oligo or polyarthritis with involvement of the cervical spine sounds a lot like rheumatoid arthritis. So these four S's um, are a perfect way to hand over the arthritis history to someone. Uh, so what arthritis conditions are we going to cover today? Well, in detail, I want to talk about osteo, rheumatoid, and gout, um, but I also want to mention pseudogout, and in your mind, I want you to consider reactive arthritis, septic arthritis, lupus, and the seronegative spondyloarthropathies, because you're going to have to know all of this one day, but for now, osteo, gout, and rheumatoid is probably enough. So osteo, what's it all about? It's joints that are used. Um, so it's sort of a wear, flare, and repair idea that you know you wear down the joint by using it. There's then inflammation, and then you repair that joint, but you don't really repair the cartilage as good as you should. And over time, there's a you know a, a net loss of functional cartilage in that joint. Um, the symptoms, so pain is made worse by mechanical activity. The stiffness of in the morning is less than half an hour. That tells you that it's not sort of a inflammatory condition. The swelling is uh, a bony swelling from, you know, either osteophyte deformity or Hebidens and Bouchard's or Bouchard's nodules. Uh, it's a gradual onset chronic condition that is progressive in nature. It's the weight-bearing joints. It's asymmetrical. It can be mono, oligo, or poly, um, and it involves the neck and the lumbar spine, typically. The lumbar spine is not affected by rheumatoid arthritis. That's something really important to remember as one of your ways of differentiating the two.
Uh, and in the history, you know, they might be a surgeon or a mechanic, someone who, you know, bears weight a lot throughout their career, um, or obese, or have a family history. Um, and the way to diagnose it is basically all the blood tests come back normal. They've got a clinical history that really fits the picture, you know, they played a lot of soccer as a kid and now their knee hurts. And then you take a plain film x-ray and you see osteophytes, joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, and subchondral cysts. That's osteoarthritis. The treatment uh, is weight loss, um, appropriate exercise, probably guided by a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist, uh, physiotherapy, which may or may not help. Uh, mainly the goal there is to maintain muscle strength to support the joint, uh, but physiotherapy really hurts, so, you know. Uh, psychological therapy, because the psychological aspect of chronic pain is just as important as the physical aspect, and if you can give someone a little bit of hope and make them focus on the positive things in their life, they won't um, sort of be as debilitated by this chronic pain that they're going to have. Um, for treatment of pain, you can trial a topical NSAID um, or go to oral paracetamol and or oral NSAIDs. And there's a bit of debate about whether paracetamol works or not, but it probably has its place and it always will. Um, Intraarticular injections, um, you can either, you know, there's, there's some interesting therapies there, but steroids is one. Um, an injection of your own blood is another one. Um, injections of hyaluronic acid, stuff like that. It's, uh, that's an odd area, I guess. Um, but the important thing to get across is that opiates don't have a long-term role. Um, even panadine fort really shouldn't be used long-term for osteoarthritis because it's just not that kind of pain and opiates aren't going to relieve it and it's more of an inflammatory pain that an NSAID should treat. Um, but only use the NSAIDs if they're safe. And that's where paracetamol comes in, is that paracetamol is much safer than NSAIDs for long-term use. And if the paracetamol's working for this person, why would you stop it? Um, but yeah, evidence is saying that NSAIDs work better than paracetamol. But, you know, whether it's placebo effect or not, if paracetamol gets the person through the day, um, and say they've got kidney disease and they can't take NSAIDs, then paracetamol it is. Surgery. Um, there's a whole big RACGP guideline on um, whether or not to do joint surgery. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a very long story, but basically for hips and knees, you can do total replacements. And there's, there's good guidelines on that if you're ever you know, interested in orthopedics. Here are Hebeden's nodules and Bouchard's nodules, or nodes, sorry. Um, Hebeden's are the distal interphalangeal joints, the ones at the very end there, number one, and Bouchard's are number two. Now, osteoarthritis can involve both the PIP and the DIP, but rheumatoid arthritis spares the DIP. You don't get Hebeden's nodules in rheumatoid arthritis. That's another differentiating feature. So Hebeden's nodules of the DIP are not a feature of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, nodules of the proximal uh, interphalangeal joint can be in both, but only osteo causes DIP nodules. Bouchards are in both, BB. One way I remember this is that if you imagine yourself climbing or, you know, rock climbing or something, you sort of use your dips more than your pips in gripping. So they get a lot of wear and tear and osteo is involved in wear and tear. So therefore you get osteo of the dips. Um, that's just my way of remembering it, but you know, dips are impacted by osteo, whereas uh, pips are impacted by rheumatoid. Both can be impacted by osteo, but rheumatoid never affects the dips. It's important to note that you can have both. So if you're old with rheumatoid, you're also gonna get osteo, so you'll end up having both anyway. Rheumatoid arthritis. We don't really totally understand the trigger, um, but there's an inflammatory pain with early morning stiffness of greater than an hour, uh, 
with warm, soft erythema on the joints. It's symmetrical because it's an autoimmune disease. It's the small and large joints, but mainly the small joints. It's a polyarthritis, and it affects the cervical spine, but not the lumbar spine. So the lumbar spine was affected by osteoarthritis, and the dips were affected by osteoarthritis. So those two joint patterns can help differentiate rheumatoid and osteo without asking a single piece of history outside of that. Um, so rheumatoid, some features you should be aware of are the swan neck deformity, boutonniere deformity, ulnar deviation of the fingers, atlantoaxial subluxation, and that the MCPs and the PIPs are frequently affected, but not the dips. Constitutional symptoms like fever, myalgia, malaise, night sweats, rheumatoid nodules, which are sort of on the elbows, in the skin, and some other places, lung fibrosis, uveitis, um, and other things. So it's an autoimmune disease. It, it has manifestations that are outside of the joints. And just for third year, be aware of Felty's syndrome, which is a rare form of rheumatoid arthritis associated with neutropenia and sometimes splenomegaly. Just, just be aware of it. <laughs> uh, on x-ray, you've got four different features compared to OA, and it might be good to put these in a table next to each other uh, and compare the two. Um, soft tissue swelling, bony erosions, joint space loss, and subluxation. The bony erosions are a unique feature compared to osteoarthritis. As well, you might see ulnar deviation on the x-ray and subluxation, which doesn't happen in osteoarthritis. Um, and here's just the ETG summary of the things that suggest rheumatoid. So anti-CCP antibody is a good marker for rheumatoid, bony erosions on x-rays and raised inflammatory markers. Here's the pathophysiology of rheumatoid. Um, you don't need to know it, but it basically just tells you uh, how the drugs to treat it might work. So interleukin-2 is involved in the signaling to activate Th1 cells, and macrophages with interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha are involved. And so the drugs involved either suppress cells directly suppress the production of these inflammatory cytokines, block the inflammatory cytokines, or block agents involved in T cell maturation to prevent Th1 activation, to prevent uh, the release of these metalloproteinases. Additionally, you've got the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which they don't totally understand how they work. So the induction of remission Initially, in someone presenting with acute sort of symptoms, you can try a conventional synthetic DMARD, um, which is methotrexate with folic acid or some of these other drugs, um, plus a steroid for symptomatic relief. And if a DMARD doesn't work, you can step it up to a uh, conventional, uh, sorry, a biological or a um, targeted synthetic DMARD. Um, and so those are sort of the more fancy sounding drugs, but methotrexate and folic acid is one that you should definitely remember. The AMH has a table of all the DMARTs, um, and there's just too many for you to remember, and it's too much to try and remember their individual cytokines that they target, but just be aware that there are more drugs than methotrexate, okay? Um, so yeah, if a conventional synthetic DMARD like methotrexate doesn't work, you can try a targeted synthetic or a biologic. Um, additionally, pain can be managed with NSAIDs as needed, and maintaining good exercise and quitting smoking have shown good evidence in you know, reducing morbidity from rheumatoid. Um, diet is a little bit controversial, um, so the standard diet advice would apply uh, you know, more fruit and vegetables and less dead animals. Gout. So gout is a disease where there's deposition of monosodium urate crystals in the joints, soft tissues, and kidneys. There's joint pain and swelling, um, and it can be sort of a initial acute attack. It can be a recurrence of an acute attack, uh, 
It can be chronic or it can be a chronic condition with acute attacks superimposed on that. Um, you can get kidney stones and renal failure from gout. Gout uh, prevalence with age and comorbidities, especially obesity, alcohol, and thiazide diuretics make gout worse because they prevent the excretion of urate. Clinical features of gout, so a painful red and swollen joint, um, and chronic gout, you've got gouty tophi and destruction of the joints if it's not treated. This is a quote from Dr. Sydenham uh, in the 1600s about gout, and I like it because a lot of questions follow this stem of someone who's woken up at 2 a.m. with severe pain in their big toe. That is just like such a good description of gout, and I've heard it so many times now with severe pain in the big toe that woke them up at 2 a.m. And it's like a demon chewing on their toe. Uh, here's the pathophys. So the gout crystals get deposited and there's an inflammatory reaction to those crystals, uh, including release of proteinases, which will actually degrade the joint over time if this isn't managed properly. The diagnosis is through that typical history with the risk factors um, but importantly, you need to aspirate the affected joint, um, whether it's the joint, the bursa, or a gouty tophi, to actually look at the crystals under a polarized microscope, where you'll see negatively birefringent needle-shaped crystals. This is different from calcium pyrophosphate, where you see a different kind of crystal. You need to do this because if you haven't confirmed that it's actually a urate crystal, then the urate lowering therapies won't work. Um, additionally, gout is invisible on x-ray, but you might be able to see the joint damage caused by the gout on x-ray. So x-ray is still a reasonable investigation for gout. Um, it's just you won't see the crystals themselves. A uh, high urate concentration doesn't confirm gout alone. You need to see those crystals under the microscope. That's what they look like, they're needles, and the whole negative birefringent thing, don't worry about it. It's just basically this yellow and blue thing and what angle they turn yellow at. Gout management. Um, the acute relief of pain can be done so by anti-inflammatories like NSAIDs or steroids or colchicine. The long-term treatment is to lower your urate, which will prevent the um, crystals from ever reforming. So xanthine oxidase inhibitors like allopurinol and uricosurex, which increase the urinary excretion of urate, such as probenicid, are regularly used. Allopurinol inhibits xanthine oxidase to prevent the production of uric acid. Calcium pyrophosphate crystal deposition disease, or pseudogout, um, is basically the exact same clinical presentation, but when you aspirate the joint fluid, you see crystals that look like this. They're positive birefringent rhomboid-shaped crystals. Now, this disease doesn't respond well to any treatment. Um, there's poor evidence, really, that anything works. Um, but NSAIDs, obviously, will relieve the acute symptoms. Now, I haven't covered everything to do with the joints, um, so I really recommend you go to Robbins and Catran on Clinical Key, which you have access to for free, um, and have a look at the joint chapter and just read over it to have a rough idea of some of the more details of each condition, and there's the link at the top of the slide. Um, as well, for the seronegative spondyloarthropathies and other conditions, have a look at AMBOSS. It's always a very good resource. So now just a little bit about muscle conditions. Um, basically, as a broad term, neurogenic muscular atrophy just refers to any lesion of the nervous system that results in atrophy of a muscle, whether that's a lower motor neuron or an upper motor neuron condition. Um, such as polio, diabetic neuropathy, spinal cord lesions, just be aware of that concept that 
you know, you could have a disease of the muscle itself or of the nerve innervating the muscle, and both would result in muscle atrophy. Muscular dystrophy is one that's sort of a myopathy that's actually a primary myopathy of the muscle itself, which is a X-linked recessive mutation in dystrophin, which causes disintegration of the muscles, elevated creatine kinase, and you get this sign called Gower's sign, or Gower's maneuver, which is due to the weakness of the muscles. If you get the child to go from a sitting position to standing, they stand in a very specific way. And because of the replacement of muscle by fat and hypertrophy of remaining muscle fibers, you can get something called calf pseudohypertrophy seen here. And this is Gower's maneuver where the child gets up by climbing on their legs using their hands because their muscles are too weak to stand up in the typical way. Just be aware of that because in third year pediatrics, every Bond Uni kid knew what this was and I had no clue what Gower's maneuver was, so there you go. <laughs> Myasthenia gravis, just another sort of neuromuscular condition to be aware of, um, is autoantibodies that target acetylcholine receptors on skeletal muscle, and then the acetylcholine receptors get endocytosed and broken down, and it means that at the neuromuscular junction there's not enough acetylcholine receptors to respond to acetylcholine, so no matter how many times the motor neuron fires, the muscle doesn't respond very well. So it presents typically first with weakness of the eye muscles and the drooping eyelids, um, but eventually weakness of other muscles too. And the treatment is anticholinesterases. They block the enzyme acetylcholinesterase to prevent acetylcholine breakdown, which means there's more acetylcholine available in the synaptic cleft to bind to whatever acetylcholine receptors are around. So you're trying to make the most of what acetylcholine receptors are remaining on the muscle. Um, additionally, you can remove the thymus to treat this condition in a lot of people, uh, which is a kind of complex topic. <laughs> okay, delirium and dementia to kind of round up this later end of PBL cases. The main difference between delirium and dementia is the uh, reversibility of delirium. So delirium is an acute state with waxing and waning um, attention span and it's changeable and you may hallucinate and it may look a lot like dementia but it's reversible. There's three sort of classic presentations and this is a slide from Dr. McConnell's lecture. Um, there's either the quiet patient, the confused patient or the anxious panicking patient. Um, obviously, there's more than this, but there's sort of, these are common stereotypes, I suppose. Another slide from Dr. McConnell's lecture, which is a picture of a textbook, um, it shows some of the organic causes of delirium, whether it's drugs, um, brain, metabolic endocrine, or infections, or post-operative. Um, you may see delirium on the surgical ward. Uh, a high yield point, especially for multi-choice and also just for life, is that um, if someone needs hearing aids or glasses and you don't give it to them for long enough, that can cause delirium on its own, especially if they're recovering from surgery and anesthesia. So making sure someone has their hearing aids and their glasses is an important prevention of delirium. Dementia. So dementia is obviously a topic that deserves hours of lectures, but here's one slide summarizing what I think you should know. Alzheimer's disease is the commonest dementia for people over 65, and memory loss is the first symptom, and the pathology is tau tangles and amyloid plaques, and it's a long-term degenerative disease. So compared to the other dementias, you should look for the age, and that memory loss is the first symptom. Compare that to vascular dementia, where the person has hypertension and a cardiovascular history, and there's a stepwise deterioration with cognitive function being stable in between each vascular event. Frontotemporal dementia, or PICS disease, 
involves the uh, accumulation of protein, which is called a PIX body in the brain. And the first symptom of this dementia is that it looks a lot like depression. It begins with apathy and disinhibition and early changes to behavior. And you're a little bit younger. So PIX disease compared to Alzheimer's, you're a bit younger and the first symptom is a mood symptom rather than a memory symptom like in Alzheimer's. Huntington's disease is a genetic disease with a family history, career, and the early age of onset compared to the other dementias. Lewy body dementia has Parkinson's symptoms and early onset visual hallucinations with depression and long-term cognitive impairment that degenerates. So visual hallucinations with Parkinson's symptoms differentiates this from the other dementias. Normal pressure hydrocephalus, the triad of wet, wacky, and wobbly, being urinary incontinence, dementia and nystagmus, and unsteadiness as that triad. You should also look at crutzfeld jakob disease, which is mad cow prion protein, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is people who have had lots of concussions throughout their life that end up with dementia, um, like football players and boxers. So if you can remember these, you can sort of answer every dementia question um, just in a sentence. Um, I hope that helps. Wernicke-Korsakoff is one to understand in a little bit more detail. It's a thiamine deficiency, which is vitamin B1, and it's reversible in the early stages. And in fact, in America, anyone that they suspect of being an alcoholic, they just give them an intramuscular thiamine injection, um, even without their consent. So that may be a thing in Australia eventually too. It begins as Wernicke encephalopathy, which is the acute and reversible state of confusion, vertical nystagmus, um, and gait ataxia. So confused gaze palsy with a gait ataxia, and then progresses to Korsakoff syndrome, which is chronic and irreversible, and it's more of a dementia with confabulation, which is making stuff up. Um, amnesia, personality changes, and hallucinations. So it begins as sort of a confused with a little bit of motor symptoms to becoming a full-blown dementia. And it's reversible by thiamine injection. Uh, this is another slide taken from Dr. McConnell, and it just compares delirium to dementia. So acute versus long-term onset, fluctuating versus progressive degenerative, um, and reversibility are uh, some factors that would be good to keep in mind. Uh, the other one is actually uh, inattention. So people with delirium can't focus, whereas those with dementia typically are able to focus. Um, it's just, you know, obviously other cognitive facets uh, have deficits, but people with delirium are sort of very waxing and waning level of consciousness. Okay, now we're going to finish up with uh, a little bit about pain and the back and then the eyes and the ears. And that concludes our brain, mind and body overview for 2020. So pain, it can be somatic um, and somatic pain can be referred. So if the bones, ligaments or tendons of the spine are damaged in any way or inflamed, you might feel that pain in your back, but more likely those structures will refer to other places in the body, and the typical pattern is described here. So, for example, sacroiliac pain refers to the buttocks and the thigh, or thoracolumbar pain refers to the iliac crests. The other thing to be aware of is the sinuvertebral nerve, which is uh, depicted by these black arrows from this PubMed article. That is a nerve that comes out and sort of curves back to innervate the disc, the meninges, the, the bar, like joint capsule sort of area. So any back pain is typically felt through this nerve. Um, conditions that are commonly involved in back pain outside of just muscular spasm and stuff. Um, the PIVJ zygot, zygopophyseal facet joint um, or the sacroiliac joint are two quite common causes of back pain in the Western world. 
neurogenic back pain, on the other hand, compared to musculoskeletal back pain, is when issues in the spinal canal cause compression of nerves in the spinal canal. So spinal canal stenosis or lateral IV foramen stenosis or the recess stenosis. Um, and that can be from osteophytes, disc herniation, and so on. So that's a neurogenic cause of back pain that will hurt your back and whatever route this nerve is going down, which brings us to radicular pain. If you compress a nerve root, you'll get a sharp shooting neurogenic pain that travels down the um, radicule, I guess we could call it, of that nerve. So it's a sharp shooting pain following that dermatomal or myotomal distribution. So these are the upper limb ones you should know, and the lower limbs. Note that the C7 one finishes at the C7 dermatome, which is the middle finger, C6 on the thumb, and C8 on the uh, pinky finger. L3 knee, S1 there, L5, L4. Um, so review your anatomy, review disc herniation and disc degeneration, review central cord syndrome, review cauda equina, review spondylolysis, spondylolithesis, spondylosis, and the Scotty dog, um, and different uh, fractures of the spine. Um, so also revise this idea of claudication. Um, which is like the muscle pain when you're walking, that it can either be neurogenic or vascular. Neurogenic claudication is pain made worse because of that neural compression. Um, and the spinal sort of canal is bigger when you flex, and that's why they get you to flex during a lumbar puncture. So anytime you're flexing your spine, the pain will be relieved. But any time you extend your spine, that space in the canal is reduced, and so the compression is made worse. And so walking downhill is actually more painful because your back is extended as you walk downhill. Whereas vascular claudication from you know atherosclerosis of a you know like the popliteal artery or something, that's made worse by activity, regardless of whether it's uphill or downhill and it's made better with rest, and it's not related to having flexion or extension of your back. Quarter equina syndrome is something that you definitely need to know, um, and it's essentially compression of the quarter equina, whether it's by a disc prolapse or something else, and it's essentially back pain plus genitourinary anorectal signs, such as incontinence and saddle anesthesia because of the S2 to S4 dermatome. So if you're on the ward and you see a patient who has back pain and a urinary catheter and no one has mentioned quarter equina syndrome, you should be very concerned. Um, and it's not as rare as you'd think because, you know, a lot of units sort of treat one thing at a time. Like there might be a 25 year old with back pain who also has some urinary issues, so they pop in a catheter and they wait for the next day to figure everything out because it was a busy day in the ED or something. So you need to be aware of this because maybe one day you'll be the difference in the world and you'll find this condition before everyone else gets to when it's too late. Because it's reversible in the early stages with neurosurgery, but it eventually becomes a permanent incontinence that will be around for the rest of your life if untreated. Uh, so the general approach to the management of back pain is that you want short-term symptomatic relief, but it should typically go away within a few weeks regardless of the cause. You can try non-pharmacological treatments, and there's no real good data to say anything's better than anything else. Um, but typically you should just, you know, take NSAIDs if you need them and get back to doing activity. Bed rest is not advised for back pain and it leads to like a vicious cycle of, if you're in bed, you mentally feel like you're sick enough to be in bed all day. That then makes the pain worse because psychologically you're convincing yourself that you're sort of in a disabled state. Whereas if you just get back to work, your back pain will heal faster. So 
that's a really important role that a GP can play in returning people to work after um, hurting their back, is to get them back into some kind of activity before they end up, you know, feeling like they're disabled for years, when in reality, it would have gone away in a few weeks if they had just gone back to activity sooner. Uh, pharmacotherapy can um, start with NSAIDs. Um, Panadol is not really recommended anymore. This is from up to date though, so who knows what Australia wants. Um, muscle relaxants can help and opiate use shouldn't really be used long term. And that's another one like benzodiazepine use that it's a big thing in Australia is, you know, there are people taking Panadine Fort for back pain, which is paracetamol and codeine, and neither of those things are recommended for back pain anymore. So, you know, it's going to be a while before we live in a perfect world. Pain itself can be nociceptive or neuropathic. Nociceptive pain is sort of that sensation of damage through inflammatory mediators, whereas neuropathic pain is sort of the burning pain of, of say, like diabetic neuropathy or something. It's, it's to do with the nerves themselves that carry the signals. Um, and no, nociceptive pain is what we deal with most of the time, and it can be somatic or visceral. Neuropathic pain can be associated with sort of a nerve injury or some kind of inflammatory damage to the nerve. Uh, psychogenic pain is sort of a difficult one. And complex regional pain syndrome is basically just pain mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and it's pretty complex, but just be aware of it for one day in the future when it's somewhere in a multi-choice on some royal college exam or something. Some definitions to know. Allodynia is a painful response to a normal stimulus. So if you just touched the skin, it would feel like pain. Hyperalgesia is, you know, if you pinch yourself, it hurts. But in hyperalgesia, it hurts way more than it normally would. Um, and then some other ones that aren't so important. But, uh, you know, hyperpathia and hyperesthesia come up in the lectures, but really it's just these two that matter. The analgesic ladder um, is a three-step ladder that begins with non-farm plus or minus paracetamol, and then plus or minus an NSAID or an oral opioid, and then everything plus or minus an IV or subcut opioid or fentanyl, which is an opioid. Um, you can start at the bottom of the ladder and climb up, or you can, based on someone's pain score, you could just start um, here, for example. You know, if someone's in really severe pain, you might go straight to an opioid in practice. Um, and then the modern pain ladder says, well, if someone's coping well and it's been a while, you could probably step them down and see how they get on. Um, and that's the process after surgery. They sort of, you start on like a um, spinal delivery of uh, a pain medication and then you step it down to like an oral opioid and then on discharge you might step them down just to paracetamol and um, sort of do it that way. The fourth step in the ladder that's a new thing is procedures. So things like, um, you know, uh, electronic stimulation and injections and surgical interventions and things like that. So how do all these analgesics work? The NSAIDs work by blocking cyclooxygenase. Um, so there are inflammatory prostaglandins produced by COX-2 that mediate inflammation and pain. And by taking the NSAID, you reduce those. And so you reduce the sensation of pain from blocking peripheral production of the actual mediators that tell you that damage is going on. COX-1 is the enzyme that handles normal function. It's the physiological one. And by blocking that, you interfere with the stomach, you know, peptic ulcers, the kidneys, decreased renal function, and platelets. Now, when you take low-dose aspirin, you're actually blocking platelets on purpose by blocking COX-1. But when you get stomach ulcers and kidney failure, that's obviously not on purpose. 
this is a diagram just to show you that this is a nerve ending and that there's a prostanoid receptor here where prostaglandins bind um, and that there's other receptors and that's where opioids and cannabinoids act to block peripheral sensation of pain. Um, paracetamol uh, is an analgesic and an antipyretic um, and it doesn't really have the same peripheral anti-inflammatory effects. It doesn't cause GI ulcers. Um, and it's more strongly associated with um, certain COX isoforms that are in the central nervous system. Um, just a side note about paracetamol. In children with fever, the reason you give them paracetamol is actually for analgesia. So if the kid has fever and pain, say from an earache, you're giving them paracetamol to treat the earache. If a child has fever but no pain, you don't need to give them anything. There used to be this idea of chasing a fever with antipyretics to bring them to a normal temperature, but now we believe in the concept of the ha hot, happy child who, you know, they're 38.5, but they're running around without crying or being in any pain at all. That child doesn't need to be given Panadol unless they start to exhibit signs of pain. That's just something interesting for pediatrics next year. Uh, opioids, they act centrally and in the spinal cord and at those peripheral nerve endings. All four of them are G-protein coupled receptors and they basically, they're inhibitory, okay? And if a opioid inhibits an inhibitory interneuron, then it's kind of excitatory. Just be aware of that. So if they directly inhibit something, then they're inhibitory. But if the thing they're inhibiting was inhibiting something else, then obviously now that other thing is going to be excitated. So that's um, just something to be aware of. That's actually the mechanism of how opioids cause pinpoint pupils, is that they inhibit the inhibitory interneuron, um, which is responsible for inhibiting the neuron that controls your um, sphincter pupillae. And so then that gets excited and constricts the pupil. You've got mu, delta, and kappa receptors. And I just want you to be aware that all of the important things come from the mu receptor. So the addictive properties of euphoria, but also the respiratory depression and the, you know, analgesia. But the kappa receptors are the ones that cause dysphoria and hallucinations. So that's just a pharmacological principle to be aware of, that the negative effects of opioids, um, of some opioids, are mediated by kappa receptors, while all the good stuff is from the mu receptor. Just a reminder to look up your toxidromes and antidotes. So things like serotonin syndrome, opioid overdose, carbon monoxide, organophosphates, atropine, and now neuroleptic malignant syndrome, um, there's probably a few others in there. Uh, for opioid overdose, we know it's respiratory depression with pinpoint pupils, and the antidote is naloxone slash naltrexone, which goes and kicks the opioid off of the opiate receptor. Eyes and ears, we're almost finished. So the, we're not going to go into much detail with the ears, but just some things to be aware of. Um, the ototoxic drugs aminoglycosides, salicylates, such as aspirin and loop diuretics, presbycusis, which is age-related hearing loss, which is loss of high-frequency hearing with age, um, noise exposure hearing loss, eustachian tube dysfunction, otitis media, especially for pediatrics, and tympanic membrane perforation, just to know that it's a thing, otosclerosis, which happens where those little ossicles ossify and then you don't transmit sound properly and there's no real treatment for it. A coleosteatoma, um, which is basically like a, it's kind of like a tumor, but not really in the ear canal, um, completely benign. It's just sort of a waxy keratin thing that sits in the ear canal. Skin cancers can block the ear canal. So you can have melanoma, um, BCC, SCC in the external ear canal. And obviously, cerumen accumulation, the most common thing that a GP will see in the ear is earwax.
um, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and the D hall pike maneuver for assessing that. Um, it's an, a stone in the posterior semicircular canal that results in this positional vertigo. And Meniere disease, just to be aware of it, is when you've got excess endolymph in that sort of system um, and you get vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. So please be aware of BPPV. That's probably the highest yield thing on this slide. Here is an eardrum, umbo in the middle, that's a good one to know, then malleus and incus in the back, and you can't see stapes. You've got the pars flaccida and the pars tensor and the cone of light. You lose the cone of light reflex when the eardrum is bulging, for example, in otitis media. This little triangle would disappear because it's not a nice tight drum, it's a bulging drum. Here's a bulging erythematous drum with yellow fluid behind it in otitis media, acute otitis media. Here's a grommet. Um, grommets are inserted for children with recurrent otitis media or what you call glue ear um, to help drain fluid and equalize the pressure. Um, basically, if their eustachian tube is unable to drain and equalize the pressure of the middle ear, uh, this grommet will help to do that. And that's inserted by an ENT surgeon. The point of equalizing the pressure is that if the pressure in the middle ear and the external ear, uh, if the middle ear is higher pressure than the external ear, then the eardrum doesn't function normally and it's like you're on an aeroplane and everything's muffled. Here's a ruptured eardrum and I hate this picture because it looks like an alien inside there. Here's how you hold an otoscope um, and he's, you know, so, yeah, this is how you actually hold an otoscope rather than how you hold an ophthalmoscope. You hold it like a pen and this gives you more control, especially if a child is moving their head around, you can rest your hand on their cheek. Eyes. So here are some of the terms that you should be familiar with by the end of the eyes block, which um, is basically entirely self-taught and just tacked on at the end of BMB. So emetropia is a normal, ref so the first thing to get clear is that in vision you have a refractive condition which is to do with focusing or a non-refractive condition I guess. Refractive conditions is what we're talking about here with emetropia being normal refraction. If this slide means nothing to you, that's all good. <laughs> Yeah, it's just stupid physics words, to be honest. Just remember that myopia is short-sightedness, hyperopia is far-sightedness, and presbyopia is a version of hyperopia where the lens gets harder and less flexible as you get older, and so you need reading glasses to read up close, whereas myopia people need distance glasses to drive. Uh, madriasis is pupil dilation. Um, and a madriatic is a drug that causes pupil dilation. This allows you to see the back of the eye better um, if you dilate the pupil. Um, and using madriatics too often is a risk factor for glaucoma um, because it reduces aqueous humor outflow and we'll see later what that is all about. Drugs that can cause madriasis are anticholinergics like atropine because acetylcholine causes pupil constriction, whereas sympathetic innovation causes pupil dilation. Cycloplegics paralyze the ciliary body to prevent accommodation. When you need to see in the distance, your ciliary muscles have to relax so that your lens becomes flat. Uh, and that's sort of a complex thing to do with the anatomy of the eye and the zonular fibers, but don't worry too much about trying to imagine how that works. Um, so these drugs paralyze those muscles and they ensure that your lens is, you know, nice and flat for distance vision. 
because sometimes if you've been working up close for too long, your ciliary muscles go into spasm and then your lens is too round and you're not able to see in the distance and that's pseudomyopia. Cataracts are opacifications of the lens um, which cause cloudy vision and it's a significant cause of blindness worldwide. And you can have congenital cataracts um, and you have to exclude those in the baby check by checking for the red reflex. So the red reflex is when you shine a light on the back of the baby's eye, you'll see red um, shine up through their pupil because of their retina. But if they've got a cataract there, it'll be yellowy white. Cataract surgery is the treatment. Uh, glaucoma. So this is a slide from Dis's workshop on glaucoma. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that there is an open angle glaucoma and a closed angle glaucoma. In opal, open angle glaucoma, the trabecular mesh where aqueous humor drains gradually blocks up. And so even though the iridocorneal angle, this angle between the iris and the cornea is open, fluid is not draining properly because the little meshwork where it has to drain through is blocked. Contrast that with acute or angle closure glaucoma where the iridocorneal angle becomes more acute. That blocks the flow of aqueous humor into the trabecular meshwork, but the meshwork itself is completely healthy. So these are two different conditions. And what typically can happen in angle closure is what you call pupillary block, where the iris goes and connects onto the lens and fluid accumulates under the iris, and then it bulges up to cause this acute closure of the iridocorneal angle. Midriatics are a risk factor for this because when you cause pupil dilation, you make this, you know, iris basically swell up as it contracts back the body of the uh, constrictor pupillae or dilator pupillae sorry um, will make it swell up and that will functionally close that angle so what does glaucoma look like so even if the aqueous humor is draining normally um, you can still get glaucoma but typically glaucoma is when that aqueous humor isn't draining, the pressure inside the eye increases and the ganglion cells in the optic disc begin to degenerate because of that pressure. But it can also happen with normal pressure, unfortunately, and they don't totally understand why. Loss of those ganglion fibers means that the optic cup expands to become more than half of the optic disc. So within the optic disc, the optic cup is the circle in the middle and the ganglion fibers line the rim of that cup. If the ganglion fibers degenerate, the hollow cup in the middle will expand in size because the rim is degenerating and you end up with a big cup with a small rim and the cup being more than 50% of the optic disc. That's glaucoma. This is a diagram I found online of uh, the typical outflow of aqueous humor. So it's produced by the ciliary body. It moves into the posterior chamber, you know, next to the lens. From the posterior chamber, it moves through the pupil into the anterior chamber. And then from the anterior chamber, the typical pathway is to go through the trabecular meshwork and the canal of Schlem to be drained by the ciliary vein, but the other pathway is uveoscleral, which goes through the iris here. That's these curvy purple ones. Why is that important? Because glaucoma treatments are based on the idea of either reducing production or increasing drainage through each of these pathways to try and reduce the intraocular pressure and prevent progression of glaucoma. So the first line in Australia is a prostaglandin analogue, and these are eye drops. These um, promote uveoscleral outflow of aqueous humour. So they promote the aqueous humour that's collecting here to drain through these squiggly purple arrows. 
and that will help to reduce intraocular pressure. Alternatively, beta blockers reduce production of aqueous humor by the ciliary body. Alpha-2 agonists, they suppress the formation and also increase the uveoscleral outflow. So we've got here reduced production, increased drainage, and then a bit of both. And you'll notice that alpha has two in its name, meaning there are two things that it does, is how I tried to remember that last year. One, two, two. The other treatments that sort of are less commonly used, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, which are a very old diuretic, they inhibit carbonic anhydrase. And in the case of aqueous humor, the movement of bicarb, which you know carbonic anhydrase is involved in to do with carbon dioxide and water becoming carbonic acid and bicarb eventually, by preventing the movement of that, you prevent the movement of water. Um, and the movement of water is important for the production of aqueous humor. So you reduce aqueous humor formation directly at the level of bicarb transport by blocking carbonic anhydrase. Mannitol is a diuretic and pilocarpine uh, has cholinergic activity and it increases trabecular outflow. So whereas the other, the other two here, prostaglandins and alpha-2s, they promoted uveoscleral outflow, pilocarpine is the only one that promotes trabecular outflow. Please be aware of a couple of these treatments and then know their mechanisms of actions um, and know the difference between open and closed angle glaucoma. Here's the AMH article that covers all of that. Macular degeneration, you need to know that there's dry and there's wet, and that dry is about subretinal accumulation of drusen, um, and then the, the accumulation of drusen under the retina causes detachment of the retinal pigment epithelium, and that is what causes degeneration of the macula in dry age-related macular degeneration. In wet age-related macular degeneration, you have angiogenesis of abnormal vessels into the subretinal space, and they're very leaky, and they leak fluid beneath the retina, and that will cause detachment of the retinal pigment epithelium. And by giving antivascular endothelial growth factor, you can prevent the growth of these blood vessels. They can degenerate, and you can prevent the progression of wet age-related macular degeneration say that five times fast. Dry macular degeneration is shown here with drusen and the displaced retinal pigment epithelium. And you can see kind of little fluffy dots on the back of the retina here and the unhappy macula. Over here is where we've got um, growth of new poorly organized blood vessels that are extravasating blood and causing displacement of the retinal pigment epithelium. And you can see here massive collections of blood and again, an unhappy looking macula. Here's a normal fundoscopic view of the back of the eye. Uh, so you've got your optic disc, the optic cup in the middle, which is the hollow area, and the neuroretinal rim, which is the sort of edge of the cup uh, created by those ganglion fibers heading down the disc. Going a little bit off to the side and inferiorly, we have the macula and the center of the macula is the fovea. We have uh, nasal and temporal fibers and we have arteries, which are the less red ones and veins, which are the big engorged ones. When you're doing fundoscopy one day, basically you find these vessels and you trace them down and then you'll eventually find the cup. And then from there, you can go across and down and you'll find the macula. Or you refer them to an ophthalmologist because you can't do it. <laughs> Here is hypertensive retinopathy. You see flame hemorrhages, cotton wool exudates, AV nicking, and microaneurysms. That's sort of the typical sort of fiery cotton wool, unhappy looking retina. This is a diabetic retinopathy, but without proliferation of vessels. Um, again, cotton wool spots, hemorrhages. So 
you don't need to differentiate the two at this point, but if you see a retina with blood on it or cotton wool exudates on it, you um, need to refer that person. The other one that you should know is papilledema. So here's a normal optic disc, very nicely defined edges, and here's one in intracranial pressure causing papilledema. Um, and you'll see that it's got fuzzy, blurry edges, and it's quite pale. And that's the end of this BMB lecture. Thank you.